If I wouldn't have done it there and then, I would have done it. Potentially, you could lead this country. What do you think? He's okay, but he has something called prune belly syndrome. I used to leave the hospital, go home, stay with this blanket in bed and just cry until it was the next time to go. But you're a fighter. Yeah. Yeah, so not today. Not today. <laughs> no, not today. Was there any point where it got really hard financially? Whenever she's sick, I take care of her. And I was like, it's my Chris. I feel a lump on the side. And the, the consulting comes in. I was like, now we're fine. But has he ever asked you difficult questions that you had no answer for? Yes. We didn't tell him. And he came out of surgery and he was angry and crying and angry and crying. Was there any point where you thought, like, how do I go on? I'd rather be in traffic than sitting in that fucking blue chair next to my son's hospital bed. So, thank you for for coming. Thank you. I know you're super busy. Obviously. Um, so let's start here. Why is, uh, why did you name your channel uh, <laughs> uh, uh, bird. bird with a French friend? Bird with a uh, So many people ask me that. It's, yeah, I'm worried. In, like, that, that's another way of saying that's really not an original question. Well done. Good job. But, no. Is this actually your full time job? You ask questions that but it's, million it's people a good, have asked before. No, no, it's, it's a good starter, I think. Um, so and it's I want important. to frame. Yes. It's important. What it means. Um, years ago, years and years ago, before I think I was still, I don't know. Um, I saw it. I saw it written somewhere. And I said, oh, how, how sweet. And it just, you know, kept going in my mind. Like, I'm paired with a French fry. You know, and then I'm like, <laughs> hey, you know, it's true. Because the full quote is, as happy as a bird with a French fry. That's the full thing. And I kept like, it kind of just kept brewing in my head. And I'm like, you know, it's true. Happiness, we complicate it. We complicate it because you need this or you want that. And you, you, you know, we think we need all these things to be happy. And you look at a bird and when you give them a French fry, you've given them the world. Yeah. And yeah. We, we, you know, we have this tendency to very, to overcomplicate what it means to be happy. And I, so I said, eh, that's a good one. And, uh, yeah, and, and had you seen this bird with a French fry thing before your life got a yes. bit complicated? Yes. So was it a kind of uh, the type of thing that you didn't really register at the time or you just registered as like what the words meant, said, but not what they meant? Exactly. It and wasn't. Then later it was like a reflection. It didn't have like the. M- so much of a deep meaning. I liked it and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, it's cool. And that like, it's really kind of deep, you know, it's cute, but it's deep, you know? Um, and then as, as time went by, I'm like, yeah. It yeah. has so much so more much meaning more. than just simply being exactly. cute and cool. Yeah. Listen, uh, so tell my audience what the name of your channel is, like where they can find you on Instagram, your handle and everything. A bird with a french fry. So they just, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, Instagram, not phobic, <laughs> just not very good at this, terrible at it. So it's just like the at sign. Yes, Listen to grandpa it. saying at, at. sign, uh, bird with a french fry. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So listen, so listen. Um, Obviously, things have been very tough for you. And I think the best way to conduct this uh, conversation is by, well, understanding the biography. So perhaps we can start this uh, when you started blogging, which was around, I believe, 20 weeks into your pregnancy. It was actually before. So like when I found out I was pregnant. Okay. Um, I was, you know, going on the internet and it's like this really fun, like exciting time. And you look up, we're looking up all these different blogs in like America and things like that. And they're reviewing all these like, you know, baby stuff. And I was like, Yara, Malta, we don't have much of this kind of stuff for, for me to go and look at these blogs that review these kids things and whatever. And I said, mm, 
all right. And at the time, we had um, a creative design agency. And um, so we were doing websites and things like that. I love to write. And I said, you know, I'm just going to start a blog. And I looked into it. I taught myself and everything. I started this blog. And I just was writing about, you know, stuff, baby stuff. And I wanted to eventually write about, you know, when you the bringing up a child and the experience and all this. And at 20 weeks, I went for the, you know, you have to do this 20 week scan. And they said, there's a problem with your baby. There's a problem with my baby. Like, what does that mean? And it just like threw me off completely because, you know, it's just like you're thrown with a ton of bricks, like. I wanted nothing more than to have this child, you know, and then they tell you there's not something wrong with this baby. So the whole time, then they said, you know, you have to start doing 4D scans. We have to see if we need to do any tests. If we want to, we have to see if we can find out if there's something wrong with the baby. So it just went on and on and on and no, they didn't find anything did, did ever. They tell you, so how, how did they realize something was... The, the scan showed um, bilateral, bilateral hydronephrosis, which means that both kidneys were inflamed. Okay. But they kept telling me, listen, this is something that we often see, especially in boys. Okay. Um, and when they are born, it's resolved. It has to right. do with the fluid. So, right. you know, I kept hoping, but they said, but we need to monitor and we need to make sure that everything kind of stays under control and there's nothing else. We're not missing anything. I said, okay, fine. Um, it's just kind of going through the motions, doing what they tell me to do and saying, you know, okay, next scan, next, hoping that they don't find anything. Um, and I remember one time the guy, I was leaving his office. Thank you very much. He's like, I'm sorry. And I turned around. I remember like clear as day. And I said, sorry. He's like, cause you're not going to enjoy this pregnancy. And that hit me. Like, I was like, shit. It was like, really? Cause I... It was like, like I feel like now. I didn't have a difficult pregnancy at all. Nothing, nothing, nothing. W was he forecasting, uh, was he right? With then the worry, yes, I didn't enjoy the pregnancy. It was just the worry though. It wasn't because I was in pain or because I was unwell. There was nothing. I didn't have a difficult pregnancy at all. Um, at, I would say, 28 weeks, I thought my water broke. Um, they were going to actually try and deliver, but then they said, no, it wasn't your water. They said, the baby's fine. So we'll... what happened was that because they kept saying, as long as there's water around the baby, it's fine. Right. Um, but what happened was that we learned after... Um, it was like, because his tummy was so um, swollen, swollen. Yeah, yeah, that it was like, it was pressure. So I lost some of the fluid. Like, So the outward pressure of the tummy yes. was causing for yes. the water to be yeah. removed from, yeah. is that from the placenta or? How, how? It's like, you, it's, it was like your water broke. It was like my water broke, okay. but it was very, it was only one time. And then thankfully they didn't, I mean, deliver because he wasn't, it wasn't time, it was fine. Any other, so there was worry, there was this episode, any other complications throughout the pregnancy? Nothing. And what about the birth itself? I had to have a cesarean C-section. So they had the whole team there and everyone ready for whatever was to come. Um, so normal, cesarean, normal. Um, and they literally, like I remember, they just lifted him up like this. I'm like, oh my God, scream, scream. And he screamed and they swooped him away. And I, I flipped out. I was like trying to get, because they strap you down. They, when they do a cesarean, they actually strap you. I started like feeling like I was going to lose consciousness because you're so panicked to, to leave. And um, I had already agreed with my husband, like if whatever happens to go with the baby. Right. For him to follow the, yeah, the child. Yeah, just go. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going. I'm, go, leave, go. <laughs> um, I didn't see him till the next day. The, the to my, Henry. I didn't, Henry, I didn't okay. see Henry till the next day. Um, I still didn't know what was wrong. Nothing. Um, oh, so, so up until now, there was no diagnosis? Okay. No, but I found out after because obviously when you're there and you're kind of, they're putting back your insides and putting you back All together. That's joyous stuff. And you kind of hear, made. you hear them clunking and putting it, squishing and 
great. Yeah. Very fun. I, I watch my wife's childbirth. Yeah. I give birth to not her birth, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, her giving birth to, to my daughter and uh, it's wild. And I've seen some yes. wild things in my life. It and is. that was pff, it crazy. Is. Crazy. Yes. yes. So yeah. Um, so then in the, in the evening when I started coming around, my husband came and he's like, you know, he's okay, but he has something called prune belly syndrome. It's like, what the fuck is that? Like, you know, and what's the first thing you do? Google. Google. Biggest mistake. Yeah. Biggest mistake. I, yeah. I, I learned that more and more and more and more because Google everything, you're going to die. Yeah. It's going to die. It's going to die. So obviously I was very, very afraid, very scared. I didn't know what was happening. Anyway, cesarean, they told me, no, you have to recover. And I'm like, hell no, I want to see my baby. I literally like, there's that rail. Every time I see that rail in Mater Day, literally, they didn't have a wheelchair. I was like, I don't care, I'm not waiting. I grabbed onto this rail and step by step, I went down to the MPICU and I was like, I need to see my baby. Um, and it just went on from there. Um, five days later, they said, you can go home and you can take your baby. I was like, are you sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I swore. I was like, I'm not going to leave this hospital without my baby. And I, yes, 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 yes. You can leave your baby. On discharge, they take blood tests. Right. Okay. So everything had been okay. But it wasn't. A baby will run a mother's blood for there's an, a certain number of hours or days, or I'm not exactly sure, the medical, whatever. What does that mean, run the mother's blood? So it will still have the mother's blood. So okay. nothing was showing. But this last blood test, they didn't know that something was going to be really horrible. We took him home. We were home for one hour. The phone rings. You have to bring him back now, 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 now. And we're like, what the fuck? Like, what is going on? This was, I think, the 13th. Thir 13th of February, we went back, turns out that um, his potassium was super high. So it was 7.9, I remember, and your heart stops at 10. Wow. Okay. If it goes up to 10, your heart will stop. So his was 7.9. Obviously, they didn't know that because for so many days, it was clear because and everything it was, was your fine. Blood. It wasn't, but still, and yeah. they told me it's very rare that after still so long, it was your blood still. And then he ended up staying in the NPICU for six weeks. How do they stabilize that? <sighs> medications. They had to give special medication. So even my um, uh, milk wasn't good. He had to have special formula because you find potassium in everything. Right, yes. Um, so it was very difficult. We had to get special formula. Um, even the medications they had to adjust. Was it's that something like, that the, the, the hospital provides? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. They were, we were really lucky because his um, consultant, she still is consultant now, she had just, she, she's a pediatric ne nephrology consultant. Nephrology is Kidney. kidneys, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so he spent six weeks, um, basically them trying to stabilize. You know, um, you obviously expected none of this. Nothing threw me in. It's like literally into the deep end. How do, how do you, you know, and I would go there I would, and I had left the hospital, so I couldn't stay there. <sighs> Did the you have time to reflect at this no, point? No, Where was, you're just, uh, just responding to the situation. Yes. No, I would go home. I would go there and um, take a blanket home crawl into bed <laughs> literally I told him the other day I was like I used to leave the hospital like just go back to go home stay with this blanket in bed and just cry until it was the next time to go to the hospital because I would go twice or three times as much as I, and then there was a time where I would go home pump milk and they would kind of give him some of my breast milk and some formula just to you know let's well, say adjusted no and plus I was recovering from the cesarean and I would just like as much as I, I had to, we'd go back and forth, back and forth, whatever, whenever we could go, we'd go. Just wait there and wait there. And it's not a nice place, huh? The MPIC, it's not nice. Why? First of all, the staff are, I don't know, a different breed of people. They are really yeah. special, amazing people. Was this the NPICU? Yes. Is, which is different to the ICU? 
Yeah. Well, it is the ICU for babies. Uh, okay, for uh, pediatric probably. Pedi- neon- neonatal intensive care unit. Okay. Okay. Right. But that also means like oh, if they're wow, born okay. with conditions. Yeah. Um, so basically, you're thrown oh, wow, into. Okay, the, so all right, I understand yeah. now. So you're in this room, this huge room, and where kids are fighting for their lives. Yes. <sighs> Littles like this, little babies that are born in the incubators, and I mean, there were times where I, I mean, I just wouldn't. I would just go be lying straight for Henry's incubator, yeah. stay with him, and I would not want to know what was going on around me, because there were some really tough situations. Yeah, but you were in a tough situation as well. Eh? Yeah, but when you hear the nurses shuffling and, and you're like, is that going to happen to me? Is that going to happen to my baby? You know, you hear them beep, monitors beeping, nurses running, doctors panicking, everything like, and I'm like. Uh, how's, how's the father dealing with this at, this at that point in the story? I don't know. I think I feel now like, I don't know. I have no idea. He was, for me, he was being very strong and very... How can I say? Maybe stoic? Yeah, he was like floating. Like I felt like, and I think we just, I, my focus was Henry, 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 Henry. He was there, but he was also trying to, he was going to university and working um, nights. Jesus, okay. And at the end, like when this was happening, he had his exams coming up and, and he's like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And this was his last year, his final year. And I was just do it, just do it because you're going to regret it and you're, you won't get this time back. And he wanted to, I said, just do the exams and just graduate and just get it over with because you won't end up doing it. But we were trying to make ends meet. Um, so he was working in a call center, I remember. And he was going to university at the same time. I remember he parked his car in Slema, the ca- our car in Slema. We had a little Opel. It got cra- Someone crashed into it in the middle of the night. This was while well, Henry was in hospital, so we ended up without a car. Then a family member was changing her car, and she gave us her car, thankfully, because, we, I mean, it was a disaster. It was like, oh, my God. Financial Seriously. pressure. <laughs> uh-huh. Obviously, this you is know. beyond anything else. But all of that pressure mounting up. I mean, yes. I remember having my kid and it was like really difficult because I was yeah. in a bad financial place when I had yeah. my kid. But uh, it, while it was very hard and, and, and I can't imagine what that's no. like, you know. I really can't. I don't want anyone to go through it. I wouldn't. All right. Okay. So, so let's go continue the story and I'll ask some kind of life lesson <laughs> questions, I guess. Um, so what happens next? Zul Vini a capricci by Abram Jawa Audesh a lithium job niet la miet in bayet kifu kol we at mil whiskey's favorite TI il Jericho tal los distillery. It hall www.viniacapricci.com. So he stabilizes, uh-huh. they work they work really hard and they're an amazing team. Um, now, tell us a bit about the team at, at, at the MPICU. They were fantastic. They were very patient, very caring. I remember once, and I still speak to her to this day, she's a nurse, um, that one of the head nurses now there. And she actually, he had the leads on him for the monitors and she did them and he had the, the, the nose tube and she did the stickers and shapes of hearts. And I went up to his incubator and I saw his eyes and I just started bawling my eyes out because it was the sweetest thing. You know, you see this little baby, we would have to put our hands in the machine to fold, to feed him, change him. We couldn't always carry him. It was terrifying because he was connected to all these wires and you're always afraid something's going to come out or he would like being a baby and he would have like the bloods, the, the cannulas, he would knock them out and he'd have blood or I'd come in and find blood in the incubator and go like, oh my God, what's... it's scary. You know, it's really scary seeing a baby. All you want to do is take them home and, you know, have a baby Good. and you're thrown with medicines. You have to feed, you have to um, change, but you have to examine everything. You have to time everything. 
his file, I remember, I remember I took, a, I actually took a picture at six weeks. He already had volume one of a file. So it was like, like this. And I was like, wow. What was that like from all the weighing and what he's eating? Everything and- they write, everything, everything, everything. He's at volume four now. Just, okay. <laughs> so, volume. so, so now you're talking, uh, at this point in the story, you're obviously talking to the doctors, you're trying to get yes. feedback, you're trying to yes. understand the situation. Yes. Trying to figure out what the future for you and your child and your family is. What? Sorry. Oh yeah, and they did tell me to remind you. About I, that. I, but the alarms will. Ah, regardless. Yes. All right. Is that is, it's is that uh, something no, important that we fine. should be taking no, care no, of? No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. You you told Kylie what she yes. needs to do and everything. Yes. 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 All right. So so what's the doctor telling you? Now? So, uh, first thing that they said was he will always have kidney issues. He has this condition called prune belly syndrome. Are the two things related or? Are they independent of one another? Mm, it's like a chicken and egg kind of thing. Okay. So do kids that um, have prune belly syndrome generally also have kidney issues? Yes. Okay. But um, there are, it's like a, you know, different levels of it, like anything. Right. So there's on one side, you know, you'll have children who are born with prune belly syndrome who just monitor um, and they check their kidneys um, not very often or, you know, just a few, every few months. Um, statistics also say that 50% die at birth. Um, another large percentage don't make it past the age of two. And then you'll have um, people like or children like Henry who will go through several procedures um, and just, you know, carry on through life with medication and things like that. And surgery. And, and exactly. Did they, did they uh, were they very transparent with you in yes. relation to how much medication is going to take, how much of your time this is going to take, how much of no. surgery? And, no. No. Okay. Because they wouldn't know. Uh, it's not something that can... No. Pretty determined. Um, they had told me, yes, he will need, probably need a kidney transplant yep. um, and interventions. But it's hard to say at the time what he will need. Right. It's, it's difficult, you know. Um, and by this time, I'm trying to read up and learn a bit more and like, you know, educate myself. But so, so let's... Uh, kind of let our audience know what prone belly syndrome actually is. Like an ab, uh, like uh, the abdomen doesn't form completely. The, the muscle. The muscle of the abdomen, right? So the um, the muscle in the abdomen doesn't form, which also gives doesn't the sorry the organs in that area don't develop either. So it's everything in that area. Um, children die because it can go up to their lungs. So they will have issues breathing and then they won't, you know, they won't survive. Does that happen because there's no structure holding the organs? No, it's because of the muscle, the, the th- nothing in that area develops properly. Okay. So if you have like the lower end of the lungs that don't develop, you're not going to have proper lung function. Yeah. Um, so for example, Henry's ureters are very lax and long. So where it would normally be stiff and, you know, his is very lax. Right. Um, his bladder, um, ureter, t- testicles, kidneys, blood, everything in that area it wouldn't have developed the way it should. And so there's a number of procedures that Henry eventually went through. Yes. Uh, when did, so guide us through kind of the story of the kidneys, the transplant, and also in the middle, there's your story yes. as well smack in the middle which is <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the just one existential crumb. slap too many uh-huh um so he 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 was fine he was stable yeah. and we had you know all these medications to make sure he stayed stable and you know they give you all the instructions and i'm like okay this is like a whole list of things you know yeah. um and this new regime that you have to get used to it's not just formula you know, we had all of this stuff to take care of. Fine, it's, it's okay. Um, I was in complete denial. I would, I, I remember changing him, rubbing his tummy, and go. You know, and now I, I looking back, I'm like, oh my god. 
Um, I rub his tummy and go, nah, they don't know what they're talking about. You're my little baby. You're perfect. This is going to go away. This is going to go away. And I would just rub his tummy and go, it's going to go away. It's fine. Didn't. At, at the time, did you really believe it was um, just a I was very a angry. Mistake? I was angry because I couldn't, I couldn't fathom. I couldn't understand why. You know, I wanted this child. I did everything that I was supposed to. You know, you don't you t eat well. You don't smoke. You don't drink. You take care. You take your vitamins. You do all the stuff that you need to do. And then why? Yeah. You know? And I just, I couldn't accept it. It was very hard for me to accept. So, and I was very angry, extremely angry. Um, I didn't want to know about... How did it, that anger manifest itself? <sighs> I didn't want to be around people and I didn't want to be anyone to be around him. So I pushed a lot of people away. And I was like, no, I'm going to spend every second, every minute with this child because I, me, me, you know, it's. I'm going to make this right. Yeah. I'm going to make, and it was, it was wrong. It was really wrong. But I think that anger, I felt it so much that I think I blame that anger on me and eventually getting sick. I really believe that that's the stress of all of that. Made me sick. Wow. Okay. I, 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 I know probably doctors or some medical practitioners probably listening going, oh my God, she's wacko. But I really feel that stress plays such a... Yeah. I think I speak to more medical doctors as time goes by that are probably very much uh, like believe you're probably right yes. uh, that there might there might have been yes. some sort of it's not in the, in the sense of i don't know chi energy or whatever oh, no it's not this hocus pocus stuff. it's like it's like maybe toxins from yes. all of the bad exactly. feeling that you get yeah. and um at the end of it i mean we're all chemistry no it's biochemistry so and each one of us are so different and so yeah. you know you can't tell me that we've put a man on the moon Right. And all we have all these genius scientists and no one can figure out a cure. And I'll tell you why I think that we haven't, because it's individual, each person. A cure for cancer. Cancer. You, you think it's, that's the issue? Yeah, we can't find the underlying cause. I know very little about cancer and it's probably because I'm terrified of it. So I kind of stay away okay, from, okay. Fr from the subject. So I, I don't know how you know, cancer takes hold of organs and whatever. I mean, I have a basic understanding of like the way yes, cells yeah. stop dying yeah. and whatever, but yeah. okay. So, um, Adele here is pointing something out from the National Cancer Institute, at Cancer Institute. And, uh, what she's pointing out is that chronic stress may cause cancer to get worse and spread, which is metastasize. Again, a word, which I find really hard to say. Um, okay, so we have this baby. You have this baby, <laughs> Henry. <laughs> Henry, and, and and you've decided that you're gonna push everyone away, and you're gonna do the mommy lioness thing, and you're gonna just figure this out for the life of you. You're gonna figure this out, but everyone's gonna have to leave me alone. And you're also very angry at having been dealt this very difficult hand. Yes. Where does it go from here? Not much time passes. I didn't ha really have much time to be, you know, in this kind of frame of mind. Which, so it makes it even worse. Um, and I remember we had, um, he had blood tests because he had to have regular blood tests. I mean, it's very hard on anyone to find veins. And still to this day, it's very hard for him, for us yes. to find veins. Yes. Um, but when he was little, it was the same. Um, they would try as much as possible to, you know, um, leave more time between blood tests, but if it needs to be done, it needs to be done. And I remember we had gone and um, his doctor was very happy with his results. And she said, okay, she said, you know what, instead of, you know, every week come, let's try every 10 days or 14 days. And we'll, and this was like the best news we'd heard in months, you know, since he was born. And it was uh, two days after I was there, I was looking at my computer and I had, you know, I said, okay, now we're going to like try and get back to normal and stabilize again and get back into routine. I said, maybe I'll pick up some freelance design just to, you know, get things going, get my mind occupied. And I did this and I went cold. 
I, I remember, and he was like this in, in my arm. I was in front of my, my computer, and I did this. I was like, oh. nah. Oh, fuck. Nah. And I, I felt, you know, the kill, the kill, kiss her, like, you know, I shot, but I shot Lara. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. and I called my sister. My sister's a doctor. And I was like, it's my Chris. I feel a lump on the side. She's like, maybe it's from like, you know, breast milk and this and that. She's like, it doesn't matter. She's like, let's, let me do a, let me find out and I'll schedule an ultrasound for you. Just go and do an ultrasound. And I spoke to my husband and I said, I'm going to go and do an ultrasound. I said, were you feeling ill at all? Were you feeling faint? Nothing. So you were literally thinking, I'm about to get back on track. Oh. And now. That's, yes, I was fine. Henry was like, I, I felt like, you know, okay, he's in a good place. You're beginning to catch a wind. Let's, yeah, let's, let's try and. And I went for this ultrasound. And obviously, you know, we had coming back and forth to the hospital. My husband stayed home with Henry. You to move your mic a bit closer. My mic a bit closer, further, this way. Yeah. Here, <laughs> this way, okay. Um, and he said, it didn't make me a lot of time. I just started with Tiffin. And so I went. And by this time, I was used to the the people nurses okay. and doctors their faces and i'm seeing her and she's doing the ultrasound which and i'm there she's like Stand all right and the, the consulting comes in i was like now we're fucked <laughs> <laughs> and she's there and she's like this in she goes i don't like what i see i was like yeah no shit i can tell you guys do not hide it well <laughs> Um, and she goes, I need to do a biopsy. And she goes, I either do it now or you come back. Do it now. Let's get it over it. I'm not coming back. You guys all know what a biopsy is? Yeah? Okay. Do you know what a biopsy is? Yes, it's like when they take a... Yeah, so the, she brings this big needle. Uh, she does it there and then? Yes. Oh, okay. It's an immediate thing. I thought yes. she would schedule no, she and prepare. Your no, she stuff. wanted, she suggested. She said, you can come back or, she can, or I can do it and now. you're like, fuck, I'm doing it Just now. do it now. Yeah. I don't want to, uh, to get it over and done with. And I was like, because then that means like planning again, coming again, the anxiety and the waiting and the, so, so she takes this big needle and I'm like, oh my God. And she sticks it in to withdraw or to extract from this lump. And she goes, okay, now you have to wait. And I didn't wait very long. And then, you know, it all starts so it's again. Oh, yeah. No, she didn't tell me anything, but she said, I don't like what I see. Yeah, from there. Okay. From there, she said. So, you know. Um, so then another floodgate opened of like tests. And then I had to do a, a scan where they inject um, a nuclear dye. So I could, I had to be away from him because it's um, like radioactive. Radioactive, that's it. Yes, radioactive. So even when you go to the bathroom after, you can't go where there are anyone else, where's anyone else, you have to like flush three times. So it's like, you know, you get rid of this. I had to stay away from him. The first time I had to so stay you, away from you him. you were in hospital? No, no, it's just in and out of tests, in tests, in and okay. out. No, but when, when they when they inject you with this nuclear dye? They just give you a cannula, they inject it. Okay. And then you can't uh, stay around babies. Uh, what's the use of that? Why do they do that? Because it's a dye that goes through. Right. Um, so that they can see where the cancer is or where the... If it, had, if it had spread and they can kind of map out where exactly. this thing has. Exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> so then. It, and, and once you do that, you go home? Yeah. And you have to stay away from people yes. for three days? No, 24 hours. 24 hours, 24 okay. hours. Um, so I had to coordinate with my mom. But by this time, how old is Henry? He was. Like a year, I believe. 15 months. Yeah, a like bit that. more than a year. Yes, okay. just over a year. Um. And I had to, he had to stay with my mom. I was like looking at him through the glass because obviously he needed medicines. I had to guide her. I had to tell this call came like, you know, another slap, another ton of bricks. Fine, we'll just go through it. And then they said, then you had the appointments and no one would tell me I had cancer. Jesus. No one. I had to corner I, my sister. I told my, I told my sister, can you guys tell me, please? I'm not going to like melt, you know? 
just tell me, do I have cancer? And like their face changes. And I'm like, just tell me, I need to deal with this. I need to know what's wrong because I have, I had Henry to take care of. So tell me what I have, tell me what I need to do. So I get it sorted, do what I have to do. And I take care of him. And then? Then I had to, they had to do surgery and then they had to start the chemo. At this point, where's your anger? I don't even know anymore. Yeah, did, did it go like, a, that's what I imagined. Like at the point it's, like you get tired of being angry. Probably. I just, I was existing in a sense of, it was like the motions were medicines, hospitals, doctors, me, him. So you did it all unquestioning? Yeah. Because my, my, my anger wasn't, I don't think, I didn't never had time to process my, my, what I was going through because I, there were days, I mean, I've said this before, I would leave Buffa and go to Mater Day because he was unwell. Right. So he'd be in the hospital. So I would go back and forth. I mean, the, the chemo took quite some time and it's, it kills you. Huh? The chemo is horrible, but I would just go, eh, more, let's get it over and done with. And Bofa was very different than Samok. No, like we were like it literally, was. literally sitting on chairs, metal next chairs to next to yeah, each yeah, other yeah. with the IV coming in. And I had the, I had the porta cat here. So you, you had the a porta cat. What is that? So instead of every time you go to get chemo, they give you the the IV. They give you give it through your vein here. I had like this little plastic button here. And they would just inject it from there, which was easier. At, at this point, are you concerned that something fatal might happen to you and Henry might wind up? I think it did cross my mind. I mean... Well, okay, sorry, continue. But I was just so concerned with taking care of him. I was like, yes, okay, give me the medicines, give me what I need and... I had to keep functioning. Yes, I just have to keep going. Okay. At this point, uh, is Henry reacting to this in any way? He was very young and he also started getting very, he was very unwell. And then, so at about 18 months. Um, so three months later, just to he give people a, kind yeah. of a framing of the timeline. So three months after. So I'm going through my chemo. Yeah. I'm going through my chemo. How long does the, 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 the chemo um, last? I think I was done in December that year. So okay. that same year. Um, he had a very, very bad infection. Very bad. Um, they didn't know what it was exactly. Um, but in, the, in the kidneys? It was in the kidneys, yes. Okay. Um, but he was unwell. It does take some time until they pinpoint because if they're not 100% sure, they do a lot of tests. He had fever. They kept telling me, you have to leave. You can't stay with him because you're immunosuppressed. You could get sick and end up somewhere else in the hospital. And, you know, I'm like, no, I'm not leaving my child. I remember fighting with them and I'd, you know, call my mom and she would stay in one corner of the, ho of the room. I would stay in the other with the mask. And that was like horrifying because he would cry. He would want me, but I wouldn't be able to hold him. But I had to be there. People would say, leave. I would leave, but I would feel worse. I would feel worse. And I was like, what if something happens when I'm not there? How am I going to live with myself? How am I going to, I would, it was the thought of being able to handle that or having to handle that was far worse than me getting sick. So I knew the repercussions of me getting sick because I was immunosuppressed. Um, but I, I couldn't be away from him. But in practical terms, maybe if you had gotten sick, things would have gotten even yes. more complicated for yes. everyone. Yes. Henry included. Yes. But emotions are, or perhaps the maternal bond is. Maybe, I don't know. I, I like transcends yes. rationale. Sometimes. Yes. So I just said, okay, what can I, what can I do for me to stay here? And they said, you can't lift him up. You can't, you have to wear a mask and you have to stay away. I was like, fine, I'm going to stay do that. I'm going to do that. I'm not going home. Know your food. Book your food intolerance and allergy test now. Browns. The Hub
الحبزة المالتي الحبزة المالتي من عند الميبول All right, so now, he, now, so you're going through cancer treatment. Henry is going through this kidney infection. Ah, wait, I missed something. At 18 months. I missed something, though, because before. Between 15 and 18? Yep, before the infection, yes. That's right. Which is, so he had a routine surgery. Okay. Which was an orchidopexy, which means because... This, it, it happens even in normal normal boys. The testicles don't come down. They don't descend. Right, so right, they right. will be up in the abdomen. Right. So they do these procedures to bring them down. Right. Um, and I was going, it was the same time I was going through treatment. And he had this routine surgery. And it's keyhole. So literally, they do an incision. Like tiny incision. Tiny. They put in, they inflate. Mm-hmm. They put in the tools into this little hole um, and they do what they need to do to bring down the testicles. Um, his tummy deflated. The nurse came and said, did he pass urine? And I said, yes, I think so. And, you know, she checked his nappy and fine. His nappy wasn't wet. And I mean, no one knew because it wasn't, you know, a nappy once it absorbs the... The moisture. You don't even, you don't realize. Um, and he started, <coughs> we realized that it wasn't. So they thought his kidney had failed. So they inserted catheter after catheter. Now, this was urethrally, the catheter. Um, trying to get him, they gave him these injections to get it to kickstart his kidney crying in the shower for him to wee, for him to wee, for him to wee. By this time, it was just getting worse and worse. At about 10 o'clock at night, they they came to me and they said, listen, we're going to take him to the MPICU, so intensive care unit. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? His consultant comes in the morning, and I remember she looks at me and she says, does he have a passport? I was like, no, what do you mean passport? And she's like, well, you need to get him a passport because we need to fly him to London. Like, like now she goes because he hasn't passed any urine in 12 hours and he's going to be sep- he's beginning to be septic so I could then oh I looked God. at him he was swollen he was swelling and they can't they couldn't do the procedure they in- didn't know what to do they okay. didn't know what was happening because they thought that his kidney was were, was failing that's why he wasn't passing urine um, they had no idea what happened and the surgery was done by his surgeon who came from the UK. Right. Um, and she came and she told me, listen, we're, but this was the day before. And she told me, you have to prepare his passport because we're going to fly him out. And then she said, and you need to stay here. I think that for me was worse than anything else. And you needed to stay in because I was Because I was doing my chemo. Because you're going through your, your chemo. She Jeez. said, you can't travel, you're, you're immunosuppressed, you're doing your chemo, you can't leave the country. And I said, you're not taking my baby. Like, I literally felt a shock go through my body. And within, you know, this, I think it was like within an hour, my mother-in-law, bless her, um, she sorted out trying to get a passport and getting everything, like, you know, sorted and this and that. And at the same time, his surgeon comes knocking on the door and he said, listen, he, apparently, I think he was or on his way to the airport already. He turned around and he said, I'm going to operate on him now. So he had come back and he said, I, I have a feeling that they thought he wouldn't make it. So he came back. He goes, I don't know what I'm going to find. I don't know what's happening. I need to, I, we need to operate. Turns out that because of his anatomy... When his tummy was deflated, because his ureter was so like long and it kinked on itself. So you can't pass urine if you had a kink, but you can't tell that with anything. So what he did was bring his ureter to the outside of his body. Oh, good. All right. So he had just like a belly button on the side of his tummy, but urine constantly coming out. So bypass his bladder. And just straight from the kidney out. Right. And this was like a whole new logistic of, so I had to 
put yeah. this three nappies on this baby. So one around his waist, another one for his opening, when he opens his bowels, you know, and poo coming out from the other side. And then another one to hold everything together. Because if you, if his tummy is very distended, everything would just fall. So this baby would every time like in, in pee. Jeez. It was, you know, and I'm like, possibly like, can we put a bag? And they had nothing, nothing available. So this was 10 years ago. Yeah. Do you know if the, the technology, the medical technology has in some way updated itself, improved? I don't know, to be honest. It's very hard because... Do you speak to, to, to parents that are going through something But they similar? have... There isn't. There aren't... I, not that I know of, no. There isn't? What do you mean there isn't? There, I don't know anyone else who's had a child or a baby with this ureterostomy. Okay. All right. What about um, uh, prune, prune... Prune belly syndrome. syndrome. In Malta, that, no. So it's, a, it's very rare. Then. Yeah, apparently. One in 40,000. Okay. One in 40,000 is a statistic. In Malta... As far as I know, there aren't anyone else. There isn't anyone else in the UK um, and the US. Um, but then his surgeon also said that he was, I think, ten months old. He said to me, he "said Had we found out while you were pregnant, we would have recommended termination." So I cried for days that time because I had. How do you feel about that? I don't know. I that that topic is very it's very gray mm -hmm. because i i don't know what i would have done if i had been faced with all of the information because if you you know that you know they tell you listen you're going to bring a child into this world and it's going to have all of these complications do you want to do that would you i don't know what i would have done till this day i asked myself but i had this baby in my hand this for me this perfect child and you're telling me that you would have recommended termination. Well, I wouldn't have had this baby. At which point did you accept that this is the way things are going to be? I think when... That's a good question. I think it was after he had that um, ureterostomy done and when we had to start traveling for his medical care. So we had to start traveling and um, there were more people taking care, like, you know, so it was more of a, you know, not just in Malta. I felt right. like, okay, this is like just here. And then, you know, all of a sudden we're going to another hospital, another country. And like, now the shit's real. What what's, uh, what's the reason you're going to other hospitals? <sighs> there, we don't have a urology department, pediatric urology department, one. Um, so after he had this ureterostomy done, um, then he had this infection as well. So this is in the same year of my chemo, okay. he had that. And then he had the infection. Um, so he had to get a kidney removed. And then after that, we started traveling for them, him to be on file because they knew that we were leading up to him having to get more procedures. It was just going that way. You know, they could foresee that there were going to be more and more procedures to be done. At which point is Henry becoming more communicative, more aware of his situation? I think also when we started traveling, when he was in different hospitals, because at that point he was three and a half, three, right. three and a half. Um, and he was more verbal, his character coming out more and more. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, and then I started seeing even the way he reacts in the hospital environment, um, how I need to help him process. We were learning about these things as well. So, you know. You were learning about the medical aspect of it or how, how to communicate with things him, with, a, with a child with him yeah and your first instinct is to not tell, tell the truth anything yeah you know and um, no it's gonna be okay and it's like you know which that's, is something he hates apparently. he hates he hates and i agree you know now i've learned um no like but you're also like that where you when you were explaining to me uh, your episode <laughs> with the cancer, with, with you know the consultant, kind of 
pussy not footing. Pussy footing around, <laughs> yeah. Whether or not, you know, to yes. tell you. you know, yes. Just fucking tell me just because to, I need to know I need to get uh, on yes, with my life. Exactly. Yeah. So he took that from mom. Possibly. 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 Okay. And uh, did that make it more difficult or more uh, or easier? The fact that now you're communicating. Easier, in, but... Easier in some ways, more difficult yes, than others, maybe. Difficult because I I couldn't speak to a child the way he wanted me maybe to speak kind of thing, you know. I. It's very hard because, I mean, the first surgery that he had when he was older, he, when we were in uh, Great Ormond Street, he, um, we didn't tell him. Nice. And he came out of surgery and he was like, we couldn't, they, they'll be in recovery and you have, they have to settle. And he was angry and crying and angry and crying. And I remember my husband saying, And he didn't speak to me, this boy, like mommy, mommy, and he didn't speak to me for like three days. He was so angry and I was like, oh, like you're thinking this child is only like, you know, little, how can he, and it was true. And he got, my husband says to me, he's like, doc, doc, look all the shit, you don't need to do, what type of hazin, you don't need to do. And from then on, was from that then, the policy? Yes. But has he has ever asked you difficult questions that you had no answer for? Yes. Yes. Very difficult. Um, even recently, this last admission he had, the question that I was dreading, why me? Yeah. And Do you ask that question? I used to, I don't anymore. Is it because it's a pointless question? Mm -hmm. Why me, why anyone? What do I have that's different from anyone else? We know that other people have been unwell. There are so many things we don't know about. Well, I don't have anything different. So it, it's almost nowadays, it's like, when is it going to be me? How is your character, your personality, how is that evolving, changing uh, with, the, with this process? I was always very quiet, very shy, very timid. I would never speak up. But I don't know now. It's like lately I've been trying to say, has my experience changed me or age? So... Right. Is it because, you know, I'm nearing 50 or is it because of what I went through? Mm. Like, you know, you know, they say, you know, after 40 or whatever, you, you stop giving a shit. shit. No, zero fucks to give. <laughs> like, you know, um, or is it because I wouldn't know because I'm only just 40 now, <laughs> guys. It's only been a couple of weeks. So I'm new to this shit. <laughs> so you have a lot Sorry. to learn. <laughs> and now I'm stupid as well. No, oh, no. <laughs> So yeah, and what, what's your conclusion? Is it age or is it? Um, I think it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Ooh. I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, I think after you've been in the trenches in the way that As you a, are, like there's you have rather. I think there is a, there is a point of well, we're we're discussing it last time, no, and you're like under so much pressure that everything else just becomes a bit like whimsical and superficial. Exactly. You know, where yeah. before I used to be like, oh my God, I have a cold and I got drama. And I once kicked my husband out for make, burning my toast because I had a sore throat. And I said, go make me toast. And he burnt it. Or it was, no, she burnt it. It was taking him long. It was saying, I was like, Jabe, duck a toast. And I flipped a switch and I kicked him. I mean, like now. Because you were like all busy yeah. picking yourself. <laughs> you know. This guy doesn't get the, yes. how much I need this toast. Now, right now. now I'll have a cold and he'll be like, Inta, right, you have a cold. Ren, it's just a cold. Seriously, I'll get over it. It's nothing. I, you know, but. So there is an upside to that, to, to this whole. I think so. I think so. It's arduous adventure yes. that you're, yes. you're still on. You're still on. So, yeah. so let's continue with, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. with more of, of the, this biography of yours, yours and Henry's, uh, who, who later. We can we can have a chat yeah, with Henry. Yeah, he, he, he said, wants to. He like wants he asked to. Me, yeah, I was showing him Donkey Kong. He's cheeky. So <laughs> I said, uh, so this is uh, like these are the video games that we used to play when we were kids. He's like, oh, in the eighties. 
like no <laughs> it was 92 <laughs> uh, so thank you uh, so yeah later later I'll grill him for that All right. and let's let's get back to your biography however so Okay, where, where are we in the story? So he's uh, having this, this uh, the kidney complication. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going through the, the cancer treatment. At which point does the, the, the transplant come into the story? Okay, so when he was three and a half, um, they started seeing the signs that his kidney, his remaining kidney was failing. So she said, okay, so we need to work up towards the transplant. We need to do work up means, you know, we have to work towards it, do all the testing, okay. find the donor. And How long is that process? It was, took a year. And it okay. was my husband. It was daddy's kidney, so short. And like till the very last minute, they kept him on his toes, Miski. And I'll get to that. Um, so... The problem was, though, that you cannot have a kidney transplant on a bladder that's not working. Because don't forget, we've had the 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 bypass. bypass So his bladder was non-functioning. So they said, you need to go back to the UK because we need to connect the kidney back to the bladder. So we had to reroute the bladder and then he would be able to be eligible for the kidney. Yes. I mean, it was in the same kind of, but before the transplant, he had to have this sorted. Right. Um, so that was um, in 2016. Okay. Um, How old is, is Henry by now? Th- three and a half. Okay. How many, how many surgeries has, has, did Four, he have? By, 14 by the time he, now. So total Since, of 14 till surgeries. Till now, yeah. 14. Till now. Um. So he had to get this done. And this was, so where he had the ureterostomy, where urine was coming out, Mm -hmm. they created a hole for us to insert a catheter to empty his bladder. Okay. Because the condition also um, doesn't let urine uh, come out urethrally. So he will never empty his bladder enough. What's happening to your business around this time? Because we skipped oh. a year and a half. <laughs> and are, are you still running at the I time where you're running no, the business? No, no. So the business no. was completely on pause. Oh, yeah. Everything okay, so it's just purely full time dedicated to yes. Henry's well being. Yes, yes. My, you my, getting better first and yes, then Henry's well being. Yes, uh, yes. Well. I mean, I had really nice, you know, people I knew who would give me like some freelance design work here and there. But this, I mean, the hus- my husband had to like try and make ends meet no matter what. I, to keep I, the household Yes, running. I mean, the bills don't, it doesn't. Bills pile up. And was there any point where it got really hard financially? Most of the time. Most of the time yes. it was. Uh, Most of the time. Firefighting. Because, yes. Steer it away, I mean. Yes. <sighs> okay. Yes. Um. My priority was him. Right. And we had family helping us out, but it was horrible for me and my husband because we were both the eldest. We never asked for help. We don't like asking for help. Him a lot less than me. Um, But then I was like, no, I mean, we need to help because we need to have things get done for Henry because this is for him, you know, it's for us. It's not because we want to go... Yeah. You know, buy a yacht or something, you know, this is, um, so yeah, so he had to get this reversed. So we, and this was new. This I couldn't, it took me a while to accept because this meant lifelong him having to insert this catheter every three hours, which he still does. And he right. sleeps with a bag. Right. So every night I still insert this tube and he sleeps with a urine drain bag. Right. And it's hard. And I knew that it was hard. And it was even for my husband because his main focus was what kind of quality of life is this child going to have? So I think our goal all the time is being able to give him the best quality of life in the capacity, like to feel as normal as possible. And I think that that's the hardest. And he doesn't understand it yet because he doesn't no, maybe his limitations. This this admission last one hit him hard. 
this one because he's older. He had a good time that he was okay. Right. Um, so he was very upset and very angry. Yeah. This time. Because he had uh, something to compare it to. No, yes. there was a period in his life where things weren't just continually testing. Exactly. Up until then, I mean, up until even after his transplant, he, I mean, school, he only went to school when he was eight, his full year of school when he was eight years old. Because otherwise, other than that, it was just us, hospitals. I, I can't imagine what that does to the psyche of a child in terms of what they think of the world. Because it's like, it's you're th thrown into the world and continually this existence is just demanding and demanding and demanding more out of you and it just never stops. Uh, presumably it could potentially make him adult quicker and, yes. and kind of like more accept like the point that you go to in your adult life where like this is just the way things are and we're yes. gonna have to deal with shit like has he shown signs of that yes he he's uh, you know he's very verbal we give him that and i really make we make it a point you know tell us how you feel tell us and it didn't take a lot of encouraging he's very open um but what I find hard is the level of his psyche or the level of his curiosity. Um, like, you know, for example, I don't know, one instance he was, we were in, in the UK and he had made a friend on the ward because he was on the renal ward and they would, you know, make friends. And... Um, his name was Oliver, I remember, and he, he hmm. they were on the ward at the same time, and he said, I want to go and see Oliver, I want to go and see Oliver. And his mom said, no, Oliver's gone down to surgery. And he was devastated. He's like, and I was like, don't worry. And she said, don't worry. She goes, when he comes back from surgery and he's feeling better, I'll let you know, and you can come to his room and, you know, have a chat or you can play. And she came and she knocked. And she's like, hey, Oliver is back. And he went running and he turned to me and he said, you see, mommy, he didn't die. And that hit me and I turned to her and I started like crying and she's like, don't worry. And Oliver happened to be slightly older than Henry. And she said to me, she goes, it's normal. She goes, they will speak like this. And that was like one of the times I was like, shit, how, how like, is he really like thinking? Like, so he's already associated surgery with death and it came up now again. So he knows that every time he's fighting for survival, again, that must do incredible things to so someone's psyche at such a young age. I mean, at such a young age. And, you know, then it was around this time as well where he was getting and very... How do you react to these things? I mean, do, are these things discussed often? Now, when he brings it up, yes. If he asks, we try and talk about it. My husband's better at talking about it than I am, but I've learned because he's taught me. I had to. I had to pick up my big girl pants and say, if this child wants to talk about it, I need to learn. I can't run away from it. I can't like show him that it's taboo because then I don't want him to think. Before Henry, was it something that for me, you yes. would discuss? No, no. I, I grew even up... Even as an adult? Even as an adult. No, it scared the shit out of me. I would never talk about death or, you know. But my husband, for example, on the other hand, it's like this cycle of life. We have to die and we die and we're born and we're dying. It's a, it's a cycle. We have to accept yeah. it. You Are know, you reality. religious at all? Um, I was brought up religious. I'm not anymore. No. No. So... I is there a story? Like, is there a story that... Because I'm, I'm agnostic and okay. my kids ask me about, about these things, you know, and she's seven um, and she's very curious about life. And she asked me about like what happens after, after we mm -hmm. die, you know, uh, and I say, we don't know. And she seems fine with that. She really seems fine with that. I think it's, it's healthy for us to give them different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, with Henry, I say we like to give him like, you know, different backgrounds of different religions, not just mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. because I feel that that's a way also for us to be tolerant of people. Yeah. 
I believe that we need to focus on being a good person rather than maybe believing in something that's going to make everything better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> if Henry grows up and says, I want to practice Catholicism. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. I, I encourage. And we like, you know, and I can tell him, look, this is a story. It's from the Bible. This is something maybe Buddhists, Buddhism, Buddhists believe, or this is something Muslims believe. Right. Yeah. But I feel that education, I wasn't given the choice. Yeah. Um, in high school, we actually had... Um, a course called World Religions, where we learned about different religions. I was, again, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, now, as, as I got older, I really kind of just said, okay, I need to think logically. And I've learned so much more that, you know, logic is what you need. And science. Yeah. I, I, um, so... Apex Media huma esperti fil-kamp tal-SEO għal snin sħa huma enu l-klienti taħħum sabiex jitilaw fil-quċċata tatfiċċija tal-Google jekk inti għet fittex outreach links, PBN builds, konsulenzi u kwalunkwe xorta ta' servizzi relatati ma' SEO mela kellem l-Apex Media. We are GSE Technologies, organizer of the Green Vision Summit and Expo and creator of the Eco Community. We've set out to educate, advocate and foster shared values for the sustenance of all. GSE Technologies is your partner in creating a sustainable and thriving world. I went through that process. This is really interesting and it's a digression from everything else, but it's, I guess it's good for us to exchange notes on this because you yes. obviously have a, a very particular perspective that you've earned. Um, so um, I went, I'm went through a process where I thought, okay, I just need to apply more logic to my life. I need more order in my life because by nature, I like to do art. I grew up writing music and plays and shooting short movies and things like that. So I was very, a very chaotic, very chaotic life, very adventurous life. Um, and as a consequence, what I didn't have was much logic um, and much order. Right. So everything was like, oh, but I feel like I, I know I have to wake up for work tomorrow at seven and I know it's 3 a.m., but I feel I need to get the band together. We need to get some weed. We need to get to the <laughs> studio and, and we're going to bang this one out. It's going to be, <laughs> then it turns out it's shit. I go to work. But anyway, that's another story. But anyway, I was just very much like a whirlwind, very com uh, impulsive, comp impulsive, impulsive, impulsive. Yeah. So, and so later they called that ADHD, they put me on medication, this, that, and the other. But anyway, over time, I realized, fuck, I need to apply logic and order. And my life did get better. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that it's just that I was lacking that side of my personality or that side, that, that side of my character, mm -hmm. which just was not developed. So, whereas when I meet other people that are perhaps like too rigid, you know, like everything needs to be accounted uh, for, yeah. everyone's a one and a zero and everything is black and it's white and it's, where's the contract for this? Um, and those people are great, but those people really enjoy uh, when, we, when we go into their lives and we enjoy when they, they come, come into, into our yes. lives. You I know? agree, I and agree. And we can like create this marriage of order and chaos and light and dark. And um, so, so while I truly uh, believe that logic is very, very important, lately now I'm returning back to um, the, also the importance of intuition and instinct. And like, I hate the word spiritual because it's just like I'm using it because I just don't know what the hell yeah, is there, yes. right? And I think it's a bit overused and everything else. Uh, but now I'm reshifting to develop, I guess, what people call the feminine side, I guess. Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, I don't know if there is a God, but I do, but I'm certain, I'm certain that there are just stuff that my very kind of limited body with its uh, limited sensors cannot pick up on. Yeah. So there's something more. There's yes. something more and I'm curious about it and yes. I want to write about it. I'm journaling my dreams recently, which I recommend everyone should know. It's really, really good. Uh, you le I learned a lot about my unconscious. But anyway, wow. so I just wanted to kind of 
take the opportunity to, to, to share that with you. Um, yeah, Adele is like, all right, let's get back to the biography. <laughs> yes, boss. <laughs> um, so cool. Uh, we can get back to the biography or we were at well, the importance of logic. How did logic help you and, and science? Yeah, because we were discussing uh, how Henry asks about yeah. mortality, religion. Uh, so how, how, is, how is that result? Where, where is he with that? Does he think? I don't know where or what he, he thinks or how or... I mean, he was going through this anger, I think this internal conflict of like, you know, being in the hospital, seeing, you know, that his, there are other kids who are suffering and, you know, there were even kids that he knew that passed while he was there. So, you know, or he'd Jeez. ask me like, you know, where's, and I'd be like, what do I tell? I, I lie, mm -hmm. you know? So it's very, very, and the things that they're faced with, you know, you, you can't hide it. You can't. Do you go to therapy? No. No? No. I, I did spend some time, but it uh, didn't work out because I didn't have the time, basically. It was offered to me when I started chemo. The person didn't, like, accommodate the time frame that I had. I don't know why. And then I just gave up and I said, okay, no. Okay, I'm going to um, do this by myself. And then I just said, yeah, I'm going to do this by I'm myself. This, this do you see uh, psychological development mm. in yourself? Mm -hmm. I'm more in tune with um, how I feel. I notice the signs of, like, for example, before Henry, then we had to go to the UK for his transplant. Um, I wanted some antidepressants just because I said, this shit is going to get hard. It's yeah. going to get very, very hard. My husband would be in one hospital. Henry would be in another hospital. I'm going to have to do this on my own. Not because I, you know, but I knew it was one of... Okay, explain that that uh, arrangement to us. So you have uh, Henry in one hospital in the UK. Yes. Okay, to do the transplant. Yes. The husband is in another hospital. Mm -hmm. In the UK. Because he's the donor. Yes. Right. Where are you? You, in the story, where where are you? Are you going? I'm with you, Henry. You're with Henry. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so tell us about that that experience. So they, they why they, are they in different uh, okay. hospitals? So when they were telling us, you know, and they said, you know, because Randolph will be at Guy's Hospital and Henry will be at Great Ormond, and I was like, wait, what? Because it's not a children's hospital, so they need to. They have a particular team to take out the kidney. And then they transport it across London, take it to Great Ormond Street to put in. Jesus. Yes. So that was super surreal. My husband looks at me at that time because I, he could see me like going, he's like, I'm like, what about you? And like, it's like, I don't want anyone next to me. He's like, you just stay with Henry and that's it. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but I, you know, he's like, Halini. like it was just like for him also, I think he just wanted that time to you know, be on his own. He, you know, in fact, then when process. I was, process, I told him, he's still to this day, he's like, you had to tell them to come. And I'm like, Mishovia, they're your family, your parents. He didn't want to tell anyone to be there. He was just going to do it and not let anyone know? No, I mean, but he didn't want anyone to go to the hospital with him. And this, he just wanted to be like, leave me alone, Tipo. Yeah. Um, it was a hard thing, not donating, but he had to stop smoking, uh, stop drinking, lose weight till the very last minute. We had to sign papers, legal papers. They interviewed me with a lawyer, everything. Tipo, is he getting paid? Are you like real, like really brutal? Like, is he you getting know, paid by who, yeah. Henry? I don't know. They, they have this, this thing in the UK. They you have, have a protocol. To, they have to ask protocol. these questions. The last... His last uh, appointment before the transplant, they told him they threatened, threatened, not threatened, but they said, you have two kilos. We're not going to do it unless you lose these two kilos. Why? What, what is the He's issue like, so would you wait? rather, I don't know, to operate or something? And he was very now unhealthy because right. he just stopped eating. He okay. came like livid, foaming at the mouth because he's like, they're going to stop the procedure because of two kilos. And at this point, it was getting more and more urgent for Henry to get the transplant. 
And if he didn't do it. How much weight did he lose? I and think, over what period of time? Um, he lost, it was, oh, I think around 20 kilos in like six months, maybe something like that. Wow. Okay. So, so he I was mean, serious about it. And yeah, at the same time, serious. he had to stop drinking. Stop drinking, stop, stop smoking, smoking, lose weight. Yes. And okay. I mean, he must have been a joy to be in around. Yeah, no. And I'm, <laughs> he came home. I remember he came home from the hospital that day and he's like, me. I was like, yeah, Jara, I'll start on time. Wow. What should you feel? I like because they're threatening not to do the transplant because of two kilos. We stayed in. I remember a whole weekend. He did. He ate leaves because then he had to go back and the, the, yeah, the week after so that he could show that. So and the question was, so you'd rather put me on an operating table, unhealthy and under like, you know, massively underweight yes. and undernourished, undernourished, mostly. Right. And you'd rather, rather operate on me. But they have like a number on a piece of paper that they have to, you know, and it's a lot of like that. Yeah. So he did it and yes. H how, uh, who's paying for all of this? So we traveled to um, the UK under the hospital. So they have an agreement with Great Ormond Street. So the mother day, the mother yes. day, the mother day, the yes. agreement. They have treatment, they have a department called Treatment Abroad. Okay. Okay. Um, while we are there, the community chest fund helps often um, with day-to-day -day expenses, um, and Putinu help for uh, with accommodation. accommodation. There were times where we stayed with the Putinu accommodation. There were times where we stay in the convent with the nuns. Right. Okay. Uh, it depends because the the Putinu accommodation is quite far from the great from Great Ormond Street. Did you get a time uh, any time with Rennie? Have you spoken to Rennie? Uh, yeah. But a gangster. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> In yes, the best yes, possible yes. way. Yes, yes, yes. They're very helpful. And um, they helped us on several occasions. Yeah, I love that game. So man. it's... And Angel as well, man. Yes, Those two guys yes, are like... Yes, yes, yes. They do, cinema. they do a lot. They do a lot, yeah. you know, and it's just a phone call away. Um, so they were there also. When he had the transplant, we stayed in the hospital accommodation. So after the transplant, we they have a hotel across the street from the hospital. Great Ormond. Yeah. Um, because re any transplant, so they have, if you have liver transplant, heart, any transplant patient, they keep you close, very close across the street. They kit you up. We had an, an apartment to ourselves and we stayed there for three months on our own because my husband came back. Of course. In total, we were there for five months that time. Um, and we were, me and Henry were there for three months on our own because they needed to see him back and forth. In the meantime, he was getting unwell. Um, because the transplant was great. Textbook, they said. Textbook. But after he kept getting infections. So that was very difficult and to And this was with. being caused by... What was causing the, the infections? Um, at the time, I don't think they knew 100%, but there was like... There would be bladder infections and okay. the risk is always like going to go up to the kidney yeah. so you know every time even till this day if he has a fever alarm bells and we have to go to the hospital basically if he has a cold let's go we spent a year his own stool inside his body would give him an infection Jesus Christ. because he wasn't uh, clearing his bowels properly so the stool would sit there like in a pocket and infect him from the inside so now he's on more treatment to be able to clean him out regularly. And like, it's like a point, you have to drink, you have to go to the bathroom, you have to do your catheter, you have to take your medicines. How many uh, points in the day do you have to do some sort of Three times interfacing a day. with all of this, like medication and catheter and... So he has medications three times a day, morning, afternoon, and in the evening. He has a bladder washout that he has to do every day. And he has to do his catheter every three hours. And also a catheter before he sleeps. And we, we insert the drain a, when a he drain, sleeps and right. we tape it to his tummy. And, you know, now he's, he gets annoyed and like at three, four in the morning, he'll yank it out. Okay. Because yeah, it's painful or because it's, it's just like in the way? It's uncomfortable. It sits in the way, you know, it's right, stays wrapping around him. Or if he'll like turn to a different side, it'll like scratch his inside because it's just a tube into his bladder. Right. Even for me, 
to get used to it and to do it. I can't see the inside of his bladder. So you're putting in this plastic and it touches the wall of his bladder. That's, I would imagine it's painful. Right. Of course. Of course. It's, it, it, it sounds painful just hearing about it. Just, you can feel it, uh, like it, it's happening. So you. he does it now himself because, you know, right. once he, once he started. Is, and is he more comfortable just doing that himself? Yeah, because I tell him, I can't feel your inside. I'd rather you learn to do it so I don't push it in too far or, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, it's making him adult quick. Oh, that, that yeah. Thing. Yeah. He's learning a lot. <laughs> what up? What up? What's she feeding you? Careful, she's made me fat. So her for what you eating? You want to come say hi? Okay. I'm not part of headphones. Are they here? Hi. Uh, he's gonna do his catheter. Uh, he's gonna do his catheter. He has to do his. Uh, he'll, he'll go do his catheter and then he'll come come see me. Yeah. Well, I'm more less day. I'm on watch and less day. Yeah, yeah, day. Yeah. You are a bibo. I'm a bibo. Jay Shorta. Hello, hello, it's my. How's it going? <laughs> so the camera is there, well done. Mela, showman and team. Let's find out. Hi, like, more and make more for the mommy, Phil Cass. It was not like a little. So, uh, was Kylie treating you okay out there? Yes. What was she doing? She was feeding you? I'm gonna she move only the... gave me a piece of bread, but it's fine with me. Are, are, you, are you even more hungry? No. We can get we can get you all kinds of food here. No, it's fine. There you go. What what video games were you playing? I was From playing the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing Pac Man, a real classic. A real classic. Do you like classic stuff? Yes. Why? What's so nice about classic stuff? I don't really know. You don't really know. It's just something magical about the past, I guess. That's it. Bro, you're cool. You too. I think me and you like met in a different life somewhere. <laughs> I yes. feel that. So aside from Pac-Man, I put you on Donkey Kong. You didn't like Donkey Kong? Eh, it was okay. But I like I played it for a bit. But then, you know, I wanted something like more classic. So I put on Pac-Man. Yeah. Do you play video games at all? I like do. Like usually? Yeah. What kind of video games do you play? Um, the most recent one that I'm playing is this Oculus VR headset. Ah, yeah, mom did say that. She didn't mention that. Yeah. yeah. yeah so that's Oculus. Do you hook that up to your to the PC or is uh, it just like a freestanding thing? Can someone pull up Oculus yeah. so I don't look like a complete degenerate? <laughs> boy, boy. Thank you. So put, it's put the picture up so I pretend to know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, so, you, so you put the, the headgear on and it's like the whole room is the video game, right? Yeah, it's like you're it's immersed like, in a world. It's like, for example, you're in like a football field, but in reality, you'll be at home. Okay. And when you're in the football field, are you like one player? Um... You can choose if you're one player or if you're playing with people all around the world. Okay, but but you're so you, but you with your headset on mm -hmm. are like chasing the ball like you're one guy in the game. Yeah. Look at me doing my video game running impersonation. <laughs> I'm amazing at this. <laughs> okay, so uh, so we're discussing your story today. Mm -hmm. You have a, a very a very particular story. You've been on a Crazy adventure, bro. Yes, very crazy. Very crazy. What's the craziest part of your adventure, man? The transplant. The transplant was the craziest part of your adventure? One of them. One of them. One All right, of them. let's talk about that one then. Why was it so crazy? Um, like, if I hadn't done 
the transplant there and then. Now don't say that I'm exaggerating a bit. Like, I, if I wouldn't have done it there and then, I would have died. Yeah, and it's, uh, but you're a fighter. Yeah. Yeah, so not today. <laughs> not today. No, not today. Crow, I love you. <laughs> so your mom worries about you. Do you worry about your mom at all? Yes. Whenever she's sick, I take care of her. Right yeah? Now. It's true, it's true. Yeah, that's so cute when you touch her face. You, yeah. <laughs> so I'm a big softy, big softy. Yeah. So, uh, and what do you do to take care of mom? Um. First, I tell her like this is with a tummy ache. Is it the same kind of tummy aches that I have? If it's a yes, I tell her to go to the bathroom. If it works out, yay, whoopee, party. If it doesn't, uh, I get her some sparkling water. Does she or fart when she gets to these kinds of... <laughs> no. No, not farting. Or she just doesn't tell you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then if she needs, I get her a wet face cloth. Okay. And then if it starts to get really bad, I get her the bucket. Okay. And the bucket's for the bleh. Yeah. For the puking. <laughs> I hate puking. Yeah. So so what other crazy adventures you've been on? Uh the mitroph. What was that? The hole that I put the catheter in. Oh okay, alright. Yeah, yeah. She 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 did explain it to us. Yes. So how do you see yourself in like 10 years time? Like where is, where is your future going? I have no idea. You probably, listen, my, my estimation is you're probably wise way beyond your years, mm -hmm. way beyond your years. Uh, you, you definitely are very good at communicating. Really? Yes. You're very charismatic. Thank you. Uh, you also are obviously very strong. Life's made you, life has tested you and you've stood up to it. So potentially you could lead this country. What do you think? Yeah, that would be cool, would but you? I wouldn't be up for it. See, I told you you were wise beyond your years. <laughs> so what would you like to do? I don't really know yet. One day at a time? One day at a time. What's your favorite thing to do right now? I don't know. What's your favorite thing to do? Come on. <laughs> Is it the Oculus? One of them, yes. One of them. How's school? It's very, very cool. Very, very cool? Yes. What's cool about school? Uh, that in the breaks, mm -hmm. like sometimes I would be with my friends at the cafeteria or... In the gym, like, there's a big basketball court. Right. But we just use it for, like, all sports, except tennis. And, and um, what's, what, what sport do you like playing? Uh, I like playing football, but on all by myself. And basketball. And basketball, do you play that with a team or...? or? Is that by uh, yourself? You, you do realize we have a basketball ring outside there? Yes, I have realized. Okay, so, okay, when we're done, yeah. we can clear out some space and we can play some, we can shoot some hoops. Are you any good? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, you think you can dunk? I can't dunk, but I can shoot. You can shoot? You got a good shot? Yeah. Okay, after we're gonna, we're gonna film it. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll keep, film, we'll keep filming it until we get it right. And it would okay. be like, I oh, tried it, did it first time, it was amazing. And the editors don't need to edit to see how bad you are. Oh! oh. <laughs> End of interview. <laughs> Get out <of> my space. <laughs> Listen, are there any other special people in your life that uh, make your life better? The only two important ones, mommy and daddy. Oh, that's beautiful. Only. 
They're the they're the main the main gang. Yeah. Why? The main boys. Main boys. Well, except With- her. <laughs> <laughs> the main boy and girl. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, me and my daughter we have a gang. It's called the uh, Chips and Taco Goon Squad. <laughs> That's a good one. It's very relevant to this conversation. <laughs> so, um, right. So, why? Why are these two people the mainstay? Well, first of all, Daddy is one of the main ones because, I mean, he gave me one of his kidneys. Yeah. Who's Dad? Would have been kinder than that. That is a very literally sacri- noble, brave, courageous. In my opinion, he, sa- he sacrificed his life. He's well, my for sure, for sure, there was. I mean, thankfully, he didn't sacrifice his life. Thankfully, he no. was willing to sacrifice his life. He was li- willing to lay yes. down his life for his son, and that's amazing. That's just if out of this world. Yeah. If so you feel very loved. I just don't know it. You don't know it? You're no. telling me. Maybe you don't know it. <laughs> Is that something you heard in a movie? You're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm on a podcast. Let me try that. <laughs> <laughs> My kids do that all the time. Like out of context uh, stuff, stuff they quote from YouTube. You watch YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. Some good stuff on there, some garbage on there. But wait, more importantly, tell me about mom and dad. Okay. نرجعكم تالية السياق ودين تحديدا بيني ولورين دا كيف أقول ما هنري قبل ما نكون بلون نشتري نرجعكم أو هوت مثلا موجود اللي سponsors كل اللي هم لو دانيل بودكاست possibly ولا أستنى نرجعكم عند اللي تابلو وزو من سيرفيسي أو من برودكت تاخون في إنتستاو down الأزيندي وما الهانغري هيبي الفيني كابريتشي تابرام البراونز الميبول الكوتريكو Apex Media, GSC Technologies, ESS Electra, Gracil Garmin, Derek, E-Cabs, li umanis li ilo maana pa Derek mil bidu net, um, u wakt li ahna at nikbru kol, u ma at jespandu internazjonalment, u i eċa ħaġa li anda ta milna l-kol gburin pala maltin, eċ naf kem umanis ferm intelligenti, kem umanis xabrika, u kem umanis li jimpenja u ruħum biex laffariet li jamlu juqorbu dejjem iktar lejle eċellenza għal daqs nanti na vera għbur li għandi dan il din il rubija ma li kebs so, da kodex plaħati jaj għarat laqna pjeta taħdida bejni u l-orenda and mom even though she hasn't gave me her kidney she probably will in the next five years when I'm 15 Because that's the estimated year of age that I'll need another kidney, sadly. Uh, yeah, she will be another, my hero in the future. But isn't she already your hero with all the things that she does for you already? Yes. Like, she's, like you're literally her life, man. <laughs> you kids don't know. You kids have no clue. None. None. Zero. Zero. You only, you know, you're going to figure this out. You figure this out when, you, yeah. when you're taking care of someone else. When you're taking care of someone else and you realize, ah, oh, I'm the only person in this world that I'm, the, I'm where the buck stops for that person. And when you realize you have that position in life, you realize, oh my God, I love this person more than my, like, understand this. Your mother loves you more than she could ever possibly love herself. It's not, it, it, I, I, you can't begin to understand it, but once, once you have kids, my good, my good, something happens in your heart. It's like there's a part of your heart that's there your whole life, but uh, you didn't look into it. And then you, like she saw Henry and like this little uh, midget in your heart, <laughs> like takes a hammer and just like, <laughs> breaks down this wall and there's like this whole field of daisies and joy and rainbows and unicorns farting <laughs> glitter and all sorts of stuff like oh, i didn't know i had that and that's just when you see your kid the first yeah. time so that's Sorry. that's what goes on in your mother's heart roughly scientifically okay. speaking <laughs> okay all right listen henry i'm gonna get back unless you've got a, 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 anything else you want to say um 
All right, listen, anytime you want to, you can go back to playing video games from 1993. <laughs> um, Not 1993, I would say 1983, 10 years back. 83, I was born, bro. <laughs> Let's not, uh, you know, like we're being nice to each other, we're being civil. <laughs> civil, this could turn ugly. You like <laughs> wrestling? No. You well, I like watching WWE though. That is right, that's wrestling. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. I, uh, well, Who do you when like? I was your age, that's what I wanted to be a wrestler. Who do I like? John Cena. I like John Cena, I like him. I like Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes? The American Nightmare. Tell not familiar. About. Tell him about John Cena, what I did. Oh, no. <laughs> so, very funny and very unrelated. Right. So, when I was in the hospital, I think it was after the transplant. Right. Uh -huh, in Great Ormond Street. Uh -huh. John Cena had came and visited and, like, donated, like, two million pounds. And I was in, like, the playroom with my play therapist. And these other people came in and she, and they said, hi, John Cena's here. Do you want to come say hi? And mama was like, mm, no, no, thank you. And they were like, okay. Who I didn't know who John Cena was. And then <laughs> when we went back to our room where daddy was, she told him that it's my dino, and he won by John, John C, John, John Cena. And she said, eh, eh, did you, <laughs> and, and he said, did you talk to him? And she said, no. And this is the best part. You know how daddy went? Don't swear. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So you guys snobbed off John Cena. You're yeah. Like, ah, whatever. Yeah. And now, like two years ago, Gordon Ramsay came. So whoopee. Gordon Ramsay came to Great Ormond Street. Great Ormond Street. Yeah. Did you speak to him? No. No. Why I not? want to, but not at Great Ormond Street. But not at Great Ormond Street. Yeah. W were you at Great Ormond Street at the time when when Ramsay came no, to visit? No, and I didn't ah, okay, want all right. to. All right, and you don't want to go back to. Uh, I don't want to. But if we have to, we have to. Yeah. Yeah. You know you did an advert for them. Yeah. When? For Great Ormond Street. When? When you wore that Christmas hat thing. They did that. That was an ad. Yeah. Uh, when you hear that you, you're going to need to do some surgery or you need to go back to the hospital. I mean, recently you had to go back to the hospital, right? Yes. You were in Gozo? was in Mother no, the Day. the first time. Yeah. The first time, yes. Then I had to go to Mother Day. Uh -huh. So you, but you were on, like you were having a vacation in Gozo, mm -hmm. if, I, if I remember correctly. Yes. And then, and then you needed to go to the... And then on the day we were supposed to leave, I got admitted to the Gozo hospital. Mm -hmm. And then on the four, on Saturday, which was the day that we were supposed to be in Malta, we ended up leaving on Saturday. And like uh, when that happens, like, mm -hmm. that unexpected moment when someone goes, we have to go to the hospital, Henry. Yeah. What goes on in your head? So there are these three or four things that go on in my head. Oh no, we have to go through this again. And the next one is, okay, let's go. That's two. Okay, two. Two things. Fine, two. And then you go. And then I just go. And do you want people to let you know exactly what's going to happen? Yes. Why? Because I want to know the truth of what they're going to do. If I don't know or they try and baby word it, I turn into Hulk. Good. <laughs> Good. Why do you want to know the truth? Because what if they, like, say that, like, for example, I'm going into, 
going to an operation. Like, okay, like, okay, Henry, we're going to take you down to, and you're going to have a very long nap, okay? And, but now, being 10, I know that they're going to do a surgery. So I just tell them, is it okay if you can try and rephrase that, please? Because you want to prepare yourself mentally, is that it? Yeah, but I already know that they're going to have to operate me. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's very... Look, most people go through life not having that switch, you know, what you have. The, that, that's, a, that's such a talent that's going to get you so far ahead in life. That moment where you go, oh, no, I really don't want to do this. And then something bigger, more grown up, says, but we have to, so we're going to do it. Let's go. Let's go. You're a hero, bro. I only commented once on your thing, like I, I before, before I got in touch with your mom. So you're walking, uh, holding that thing. When uh, you left, when you started walking after the surgery. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this is the, honestly, it was the, f the first time I came across your story. Really? And, um, yeah, the look in your eyes was, was, uh, not common in the eyes of kids. Like, there is a, there is, a, I, I said it to you before, I said it to you again, there's a, there's a wisdom to you. I wish you well, fair soldier. I wish you well. Thank you. All right, man. Let me continue hearing the story from your mom. So, Henry, you know what? You're the youngest person ever on the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, by far. We broke the record. By, by far. far. By far. Yeah. My daughter is never going to let me live this down. <laughs> yeah. We should hang out, though, with yeah. Yeah, you, my daughter, us. We should, should definitely should, hang out. Should. Definitely. What would you like to do? Where would you like to go? Where would I like to go? I would like to go to a lot of places. Like name one. America. Oh no, in Malta. Oh, no, like for, ah, uh, in Malta, in Malta. For like okay. lunch. Ah, for lunch. Uh, or playing. Ah, playing. <sighs> To be honest. No, lie to me. Of course I watch anime. <laughs> to be honest, I want to go to school. You want to go to school? I have no idea why, but I just want to go to school. But if you meet people outside of school, where do you want to go? Hmm. I want to go swimming. Swimming? Yeah. Swimming sounds cool. Cinema, maybe? You like cinema? Yeah. You like laser tag? Yes. You know, man, I love laser been. tag. A lot. Yes, have I you been? Yeah. yeah. You've been to laser tag? Yes. All right. And I've been to paintball. What's your, what do you prefer, paintball or laser tag? Paintball. Really? Yeah. It's more warlike. Yeah. It, you actually feel uh, feel the... Like when they hit you, it's, it's not terribly painful, but you can actually feel like you've been hit. The problem yeah. with paintball is that people cheat. Yeah. With, with laser tag, you can't cheat. Like, or you're thinking that they're cheating and now there's a whole bunch of doubt and before you know it, everyone's throwing rifles around going, I hit you, bro. And then bro's going, <laughs> what are you, blind? And then it gets like, well, well, with laser tag, hey, computers will, will deal with that for you. Yeah. So maybe we'll hook that up. Yeah. We'll like do a, a, a kiddie afternoon of laser <laughs> tag. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay, listen. Yes. It's obvious you love the mic. You can stay, and I can okay. keep talking to mom. That's all right. Or you can go outside, and we uh, we can make sure that you have a, a fun time outside. Okay. How's, how's Kylie as a babysitter? One to ten. Ten. Yes, she got a one. You got a one. Ten. No, she got a ten. Hey, you got a full, okay, that's all right. Nah, I, just, I just like being mean to Kylie. No. <laughs> just like being mean to Kylie. No. Because she's always mean to me. So I'm just reciprocating. No, it doesn't I, mean you should be mean to her, though. Cause, yeah, because she's a lady, right? It's debatable, but anyway. <laughs> no. No. That's wrong. 
All right. There okay. you go. Doors that way, son. Bye bye. See you later, alligator. <laughs> he loves the mic. Huh? He loves the. He's thing. good at it, eh? He loves it. He's good. At it, very relaxed. Yeah. He's <laughs> so, uh, would you like a coffee, a whiskey, uh, or some water? <laughs> I'll just stick to water for now. You stick to water. <laughs> I'll stick to huh? uh, whiskey. Gin? So, no. I, I will have a whiskey later. You'll have a whiskey later. I'll have a, uh, some ice, please. And whiskey. Treat? Sure. Yes? All right. <laughs> so, let's see who wants whiskey around. Yeah. Uh, here we go. You should do archery. And archery is fun. Ah. But also, uh, laser tag is fun. Have you tried yeah. laser tag in Cordin? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I loved it. I don't know. But I, I was there with a bunch of uh, my son's friends for his birthday. The, the paintball or uh, laser tag? Laser tag. tag. I got oh, yeah. way too... And not, there's one in Cordin, not at, not at Bay Street. So there's one in Bay Street, same company runs... Oh, they're sorry, they're sorry, about sorry. to be the free advert. <laughs> so they, they, the same company runs the one in Bay Street. They run the one in Cordin. And I think right. they have some other place. Once we did it in a field for, I believe it was, uh, ah, it was ah, Jones's, Jones's bachelor party. Uh, yeah, mega, mega fun. Super okay. fun. Um, and, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a boy thing, but I got like really into it and I made sure all my son's friends got really into it. And as you start- It's fun, it's fun. It is fun. The adrenaline of like fake shooting people is, is great. Even real shooting. I'd gone to a range once. Yeah? Yeah, that was my husband's Christmas present last year. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to vent. Yes, it was. I was Burn like, when bullets. do we do this again? I didn't think I was going to like it so much. Yes, I think most people- Yeah. Uh, especially people that are don't have a propensity for violence tend to think that uh, okay I'll try it whatever and then they you, you fire the first bullet and you feel power coursing through yeah. your finger like you're some goddamn modern day Zeus. then I said I was like I get it <laughs> exactly. I get it did you watch you just said a line <laughs> from American Beauty did you watch American yes, Beauty yes yes and I think yes, that's exactly yes, what she yes, says as yes, soon as yes, she fires yes. she goes boom I get it. Yeah. So there we go, condoning firearms. Kids, well, don't try this at home. Uh, it's not the firearms, the person behind the firearm. Yes. The, the, look, the firearms uh, debate is a very complicated yes, one. Yes, very. In the States, it gets even more complicated. More, yeah. Um, I, I seem to think that um, it's not the, the it's not the weapon, but I think it's, it's like the, the way this, the the American society is structured that people kind of tend to fall by the periphery mm -hmm. and start plotting manic things in their mother's basement, and then they have access to weapons. Exactly. The, uh, yeah. But all the mental health stuff that precedes it uh, needs to be addressed. And I think it's also uh, I'm not an expert in the, in, in the conversation at all. No. But from what I, from what I've seen from the documentaries I've seen and from all the news reports, it feels like it's a bit too easy for anyone. It is. To I get think a I get that. I feel that that as well. It's yeah. Really bad. Yeah. Shouldn't You're be that easy. You're from Toronto. Oh, Ash, we were. Yeah. We were meant to say that in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Do your fucking job, John. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck. Um, so yeah, you're from from Toronto. So, yes. did anything in your childhood prepare you for all of this? No, I was like such a quiet child. I was like Nisha, you know. I, yeah. Wherever you put me, I'd stay. Never spoke out of place, or you know, I was very always in the back. I never spoke up. I was very very protected. I was just that, like, quiet child, you know? Uh, Not... How many, uh, how many siblings? Two. Younger. Two brother. younger ones? Yes. You're the older one? Yes. Okay. Yes. A All brother right. and a sister. So, listen, let's go back to the story. Where were we in the story? Can someone just dial me back <laughs> into <laughs> the... Infections. Infections. After, after, after the, the kidneys. So, now he's three and a half. 
No, now he's four and a half. Four after, and a half. After the transplant. And he's getting repeated infections. Yes. Okay. Infection after infection. Um, and we, you know, after so many times, I mean, there were months where he would be admitted twice. Yeah. And each admission would mean antibiotics. Okay. Now, I don't know how much you know about having repeated antibiotics, but eventually you become immune. Uh, no, that I didn't know. I know it yes. crashes your uh, stomach, uh, your yes. gut f flora, flora. Yes. That's, I didn't know you become immune. Yeah, you become immune and they, um, the bugs just get smarter and they will bypass, basically. The antibiotics won't work anymore. Okay. So he got to a point where he was taking antibiotics and nothing was working anymore. And we had to go back to the UK and the some guy from the hospital came and he said, you know, he said, we've put our heads together and we don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. And I stood there and said, well, what do you mean? You know? And um, it was in so many words, if he gets sick again, we have nothing. Right. And I remember leaving the hospital that day and I could feel like just me and my husband were like w walking on, I don't know what, because we knew every two, three weeks he was getting sick. And we were like, if he gets sick again, right. what do we do? We just Thank you, man. wait for the worst. Right. And it was that. It, I mean, it was going through my mind. It was going through my husband's mind. And we're like, she's so bad. You know? Yeah. And you don't want to think it, but you know it. And you don't want to say it, but it's there. And it's just like you're waiting. And <clears throat> and then every like time he's, you know, you see him different. You're like, are you okay? Is something wrong? And you get that like pit, that that like, you know, in your that pit in your stomach saying like, is this going to happen again? You know what I'm saying? And then I remember there was, they, they really focus a lot on the mother, how the mother feels, what yeah. the mother thinks. And they're doing it more here now. They have a tendency to, and I remember one of the nurses, she, she came and she said, well, what do you think we should do? I looked at her and I was like, I don't know. You guys are like the, the, the people. And they're yeah. like, well, because, you know, you're with him and maybe there's something that we're not picking up, picking on. up on or maybe, you know, well, something we can try or, and I was like, I don't know, maybe we can reduce immunosuppression a little if it works a bit. So, cause you know, in my small mind, mm -hmm. if you have someone who is severe, like is on high immunosuppressants, their body doesn't fight. W what are immunosuppressants? Exactly? So he takes medication for right. his body not to reject the kidney. So that okay, means that. Right. that your immune system is low, which is why he would get infection after infection, or even if someone had a cold. H how long is, was he on that for? The He's still on it. So oh. long as he has, so long as he, he, he has it, a kidney that is, that belongs not to his. someone else. Yes. All right. If you stop that, the body starts to fight the kidney. So Modern. we're constantly adjusting okay. that as well. So every time- Presumably that makes him vulnerable to all sorts of yeah. other issues. Yeah. So even at school, for example, they would call me and say, listen, someone sneezed in the class. Do you want to come and pick him up? Yes, so I come. Or whatever. Is it the case that uh, just a regular flu can develop into something a yes. bit more complicated? Yes. yes, with him it's, and it's also, it can be more complicated or you can't rule out that he has a fever from a flu or is it a fever because his body is rejecting a kidney? Because that can happen. So it's always, Is there you know, a way to identify between the two? <clears throat> no, on, on my own, no. So okay. when he has a fever, it's like, okay. I mean, now I kind of do the checks and say, you know, what's happening and I don't, I, I can communicate with the doctors to, you know, say, listen, he has this. Okay. And how high is the fever? All right. It's 37.9. All right. Hold off a bit. If it gets more than 38, then you have to bring him in. So there's like even the degree of, of a fever that, yeah. okay. But we've learned that, you know, so before it was like, oh my gosh, fever, any, you have to go running, running, running. Right. 
right, right. And that's just, it puts you on edge like so bad. And for him, because then it's a, he's unwell. We have to put a cannula. He has to do, you know, this the cannula mm-hmm. where they do the to inject um, the medication. Yeah, man. The, the he anxiety hates it. must be uh-huh. at an all time high. Yes. All the time. Then I learned, I said, okay, I have to deal with this because mm-hmm. before the transplant, I wanted antidepressants. Yeah. Because I didn't know how I was going to cope with them being in different hospitals, dealing with, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right. I knew that I would have to, you know, help Henry recover, but my husband wasn't there. So, yeah. And um, I remember I got the, <laughs> it's a very funny story, not funny maybe. I got the antidepressants mm-hmm. and I accidentally took more than I should have. I misread the prescription on the box. All right. And I was hallucinating. What what uh, what medication was it? I don't. I forgot the name. It was an antidepressant. It was a, a a pill. So I I was literally hallucinating. I was um I was really tripping really badly, like paranoia. I was in the car with Henry. I couldn't drive. I was seeing like everything, like the roads dropping. I was terrified. And in the evening, I called my sister to dish tight me. I said, "You have not not ni hotel." I said, "Shara," and I was telling her, and she's like, "Zom wada." She's like, "It's kem hot." I said, "I took two." I said, two. She's like, "You were supposed to take half." Okay, Jesus. And I said, "Okay, that's it." I threw the box out. I said, I'm "Not taking anymore. I'm going to deal with this on my own. I don't need it." I was, it's that, it scared me so much that I said, no, I'm not, I am going to deal with it. I take like these herbal drops that really help me. Um, In what way do they help? They calm. What What are the herbal drops? Uh, Bach flower remedies. What was that? Bach flower remedies. They're uh, really how do you spell that? B-A-C-H. Oh, like the composer. Yes. If, uh and, and and what's what's inside of them? It's herbal. It's nothing. <clears throat> or original Bach flower remedies. Okay. Ah, okay. So uh, so it's not uh, Bach is not the active ingredient. It's a brand. Yeah. Okay. There, it's herbal, herbal flo- herbs, flowers. I find them very. So whether it's placebo. I have no idea, but I always have one. If it works, it works. If it works, <laughs> it works. Um, yeah. But there have been instances where, I mean, I've suffered f- with anxiety for long before Henry, right. so it just heightened. Um, but I always said I needed to be like lucid to be able to know what's happening because if something happens and I'm not focused, then what do I do? You know, even if... A lot of times I'm with Henry mm-hmm. and my husband isn't there, but I like call him and say, listen, this and this has happened. Or, you know, some, I have to be able to be able to tell him. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Was there any point where you thought, like, how do I go on? The podcast is a project independent and healing from the influence of the party and the bar and lobby groups that are in the back. You stay up and you tell the best you can entertain. Jiet nappellalek biex izzur il-ħolqa ta' fuq jew jekk qed issegwi lil-end mill-YouTube billi tidħol ġewwa patreon.com forward slash John Mallija u tiena daqqa tiet. Tinsiex. Il-podcast ta' John huwa l-podcast tagħna l- ħadwa. Apa saw bro. I remember one particular time when this this these episodes kept happening, 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 and I just I got on the bus and my husband, we were in London and my husband said, go out a bit. He said, yeah. just, just, you know, so get away. Mm. And I got on the bus. I didn't know where I was going. And I was on the side and I was saying to myself, I'm not going to go back. I'm just going to stay on this bus. Don't care where it takes me. I don't. And I, for that, like, so 30 seconds mm-hmm. and it had never happened to me before that I was, I don't know, I wanted to run away. I, I had never felt that, but I was so tired of 
in and out of hospital, no answers, no nothing that we could do. I didn't know what was happening. I said, I don't, I'm not going to go back. I'm, I'm just going to stay on this bus. I don't care where it takes me. I'm just going to stay. And then, and then not obviously I didn't, but it crossed my mind. It crossed your mind that how far did that bus go? I don't know. And then, and then in fact, I got off and I was like, I didn't know where the hell I was. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, yeah. So I get into these, like, when it's very, like, heavy. <sighs> it's hard to explain, but I, it's like that saying, you know, it's just a dunya. But I just feel like I'm in this bubble and I feel like I, I don't know, like, come at me. Mm-mm. hit me. I'm not going to feel it. It sounds like a bit weird. I don't know. Or I'm, I'm not being like... But Well, you've been to a very, not weird place, but a place that is not common. So you obviously feel kind of weird, th- like not normal things because your, uh, yeah. your story is not a, a regular one. You know, so obviously what you're processing is not normal. No. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, you know, when even when he's in the hospital, I go out and it's like, I feel like a zombie. Yeah. And I feel like floating, but like tipo, if if a car would hit me, I probably just like I yeah. feel nothing. Feel I f- and that has really changed me. Even that has mm. changed me because I feel like I've become devoid of certain emotions. Certain like sometimes. There was a time, for example, he, he pointed out to me, he, he said, you're very cold, mommy. You don't cry. Hmm. And th- that really struck me really uh, hard because I was always a very overly antsy, overly hmm. emotional person. Yep. But then there were so many years. How, how do you view this development as a... I hate it. Oh, you hate it? Yes. Okay. Because it's not me. I'm... Hmm. I'm very warm, I'm very loving, I'm very, very emotional. I consider myself a very emotional person, but I cannot cry anymore. It's hard, like sometimes now in this admission, when Henry was in the hospital, I was not forcing myself, but it was, I was letting it. I was Mm. saying, okay, cry, cry, cry. But it backfired because then he would be upset and then he would go, he would start to cry. He'd see me crying and going, I'm going to be okay, mommy. Don't cry. Don't cry. I'm going to be, I'm going to be okay. And I'd be like, Lala, man, I can't just fucking get this right, man. Because now he's, he's seeing me cry. Yeah. So if I cry, it's wrong. If I don't cry, it's wrong. It, from an outsider's perspective, what that appears to be is that there is such a deep connection between you two, that there is this counterbalance, like you're a countervailing force to one another. Uh-huh. So anytime you're drifting too far off, he'll play anchor and any yes. time like but obviously you're the adult you're the mother so most of the time you're gonna have to play anchor it's obviously very uh, you know we all like to feel the emotions and we all like to feel the um, love and warmth especially if we're used to feeling yeah. those emotions and i didn't want to show him and then i said does he feel like it's not good to cry because I'm not crying. Mm. Does he feel like he shouldn't cry? I don't want him not to cry. Mm. Um, and then, I mean, this time, he, I, he's, sometimes I'll, he did struggle with crying because in fact, I would tell him, <laughs> <That's it. clears throat> he would like want to cry and he'd be like, but I can't, but I can't. And I'm like, okay, just try, just try. Um, no, but then it was like, you know, he sees me crying, he stops crying. And that took strength as well from him because I knew like this time, this admission just, I mean, every time, for example, so when he was sick, we, had, we, we went in and they said, we have to do an NG tube. And I'm like, my heart sank. The NG tube is the nasogastric tube that goes in through his nose, the back of his throat and into his stomach. And when I told him, I was like, okay, it's not nice. And when I tell him that, Already he is, he puts up his armor. It's okay, mommy. And I'll be like, you have to get an NG tube. And he'll, he'll cringe. And I'll be like, it's okay. And he doesn't want, 
even when he does the bloods or whatever, he doesn't want that, you know, holding down or that like, you know, I'm just there behind. He sits on my lap I'm there. He knows I'm there, but that's all. He doesn't need or want that like suffocating, whatever. It's like I, I can do it. Even so when he did the NG tube, he's just sat there and froze. And I'm the one that started crying because I saw like this in, incredible like, how do you say, self-like power, not power in the sense of, but this... Resilience, maybe? That, yeah, that, this resilience of, but even in that moment. If, and I'm going, like, if it was me, yeah. and even them, the nurses, they're like, we do this on adults and they don't sit still like you did. Yeah. Yeah. And this one admission, he had to get it three times because he was get well and they'd pull it out thinking that he's going to... Then he gets sick again, and they'll be like, we have to do it again. And every time he would just stay there, he'd hate it. It's horrible. And even just the time he has to stay with it. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I, I, I tell him, you're, you're really brave. I wouldn't have handled it like yeah. that. I wouldn't have. I mean, where he is now, mentally, I don't know how many books about Stoicism and Marcus Aurelius diaries people read like late into their adult life and they don't get there. You know who gets there? Like someone like Chos gets there, like boxers get there. Mm. So uh, people that are just like interfacing with like the harshness of reality. I, I, I'm t I was so fascinated. And just for me to be faced with these instances and these things that he says. Do you worry that he's like in some... In some uh, elements of him, or so. there's a part of him that is already a man. Yes, I, it, it's hard. It was very hard to deal with that because I, I love you know childhood is so beautiful. There's like that innocence, and mm -hmm. it's like he doesn't he didn't have time to have that innocence. Mm -hmm. He 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 had to grow up very quickly. He doesn't even know what it is. I mean, he can, obviously he has these moments where he wants to play, yeah. but even, you know, when you ask him, what do you mm. like to do? He doesn't even. That's all you can do. All right. So where does the story go after the, after um, post infections? Um, then, thanks to his doctors, again, you know, sh they say this is, this is what he needs to do. He has to take this, like, huge regime of laxatives and to em make sure we empty. Um, and we have to do this bladder washout every day to, you know, clear him out. Um, and we just hoped that it would settle. And it did until we we kind of we got into this system of you know the medications, drinking enough water, washing out his bladder. It's just, and we are you know between me and my husband, we're like nag, 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 and he hates it. Oh, he hates it because he just wants to be a child, and I don't blame him. It Which it, it kills me because we there's also the element of I think the saddest thing that I feel from all of this is that I didn't enjoy him as a child or let him enjoy his childhood because all I do is tell him about the medical stuff, medical stuff, medical stuff. And at mm. the end of the day, we, Shh. sorry. That's fine. He has to take his medicines. Today, Kai. He's in medicine Yes. Quack, quack. El Pabra. Um, and I started to realize because when he's taking his medicines, we have his catheter, he drank his water, and we're lying in bed at that, you know, whatever time it is. And we joke and we laugh and we, and I'm like, it's not fair because I spend the whole day. And then he'll tell me, you're funny, mommy. And I'm like, he's like, how come you're not funny like this in the day? I can't. Because you can't, though. I'm, I'm doing everything for me, for you to survive. 
we have no there and I hate that we have no time for me to be the person that I want to be with him, the one I want, the mom that I wanted to be, the fun mom, the mm. you know, because we play. Like my my husband tells mm. he comes out we had on its name. Because I get very playful. Cute. I want to, you know, do things. I joke, yes, let's do this, let's do that. Then we'll be having fun. And even that, I mean sometimes I'm like, fuck it. I don't care. You know, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. And my husband Isma, عاد بقالوا فلوش كون المدام بس نبدأ نجيد. ها ما شربش. كيف ما تلوش ما يشربش. Then that comes in. You know, you know, we're just having fun. Yeah. You know, and then I become a child and I start literally stomping my feet just. Just because I just want to have fun with my kids. Yeah, he does too. But you know, we 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 have to. But and then I get more pissed off because I'm just like, just fucking leave him for a second. You know, let's. I just want him to have fun. But then, you know, it switches on and I'm like, yeah, you know, okay, Henry, you have to drink, you have to take your medicines, you have to stop, you have to do this. Even for him, mm-hmm. it's, it's shit, you know? And then I re- I start, when I started realizing that, it was like, that's not, that for me is not fair. Where is he now in his medical journey? He has to take the immunosuppression. In the morning, plus the laxatives to help loosen his stool, so he'll be able to open his bowels regularly. Because since he doesn't have the abdominal muscle, it's hard for him to push. To contract them. So even when he was younger and he had to poo, he'd say like, "Mummy, squeeze my tummy," and I would like help physically push his tummy to so for him to poo. Um, he takes his medicines. We, I'm trying to kind of give him the independence to. You know, take them, but it's a struggle because yeah. I prepare them, and they're you know he knows, and sometimes if he if he goes to scouts, we'll label them and you know hope that he t- takes them. He has to drink his water, um. But you kind of there's like this time where you have to let go and trust him. Yeah, we'll shake. but he's still a child. Yeah, he's only ten. Uh, you know, we started this podcast and you kind of described to us <coughs> why you chose to call the channel uh, a bird with a french fry. And it's because we, you know, the, at the core of what you're putting out there and what you're telling people with that with that name is that us as human beings, our species, we tend to um, complicate the road to happiness. Has this difficult journey that that you've been made to endure no that you've endured because there were points where you said oh i wanted to go away but you didn't Uh, has any of that explained a simpler route to happiness yes because it is what it is do i stay angry or do i Because when I sort of turned off that switch to stop being angry, I realized because he was feeding off of the way I felt and everyone around me, it was just the anger just kept bringing me down and anger produces more anger and anxiety. And this. so I'm like, no, it's not, I, don't, I can't let it take over my life and let it over his as well. So if yeah. I'm angry, I'm just gonna, it's gonna go on to him. Right. So I always, when I feel like I feel overwhelmed or I feel like I'm going to get angry, I'm like, no, let's just simplify it. It doesn't, it's, it's, it is what it is. I have to deal with it one foot in front of the other. And I don't mean it like, you know, positivity and happiness, not in a toxic way. You have to weigh it out. You know, there's balance and even the bad, you need, we need the bad for us to see the good, mm-hmm. you know? So we have to have a balance of both i think and mm-hmm. it's only then when you appreciate how the little things make you happy yeah, yeah i yeah. mean uh, i i refer to this story often um we complain about traffic right like everybody's like road rage and like you know get out of my way and this and that and i'm in traffic and i smile i love I love it Like it's a matter of like, yes, it is. It's there. Can we do something about it? Not really. I have to get somewhere. I get in my car, just go. 
And so many times I've been in traffic and just say, I'm happy I'm in traffic because I'd rather be in traffic than sitting in that fucking blue chair next to my son's hospital bed. It's traffic. So it was the... It, it, your interface with the darker elements of life that showed you a faster or a less complicated way to peace. Yes. It really gave me an internal peace, whereas before I'd be like, oh, no, everything has to be like this, that, and the other. And no, it doesn't. What, what does that really mean? All that stuff having to be... Why is there, is there a competition? Is there a race? Is there... Yeah. Life already throws that at you, whether yeah. even when you don't want it. So why do we have to add to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. You know, we all want nice cars. We all want big houses. And we all want like all the nice things. But in the end, is it mm -hmm. really what's important? Because I've come, I've seen the other side of shit, like... He's really unwell. They don't know what's happening. I was unwell. I don't know what's happening. None of that matters. None of it. Even in the hospital now, you know, how many messages people were messaging me and saying, does he need anything? Does he want anything? Do you need anything? And I'm like, no. And I would say, Henry, is there something you want? Even I was trying to fulfill... <sighs> some desire some... of him so he could feel... He said, mommy, I want, to, I want to eat and I want to go home. That's it. What does that give you, sharing your story? I mean, you've just, you know, been on this podcast. We've completely shared in the most transparent way for audience that weren't here before the camera is rolling, obviously. Uh, I said, listen, if there's any question that I ask, because I'm uh, quite, a, you know, I'm, no, I'm nosy. It's my <laughs> um, And also my face. Apparently, they keep telling me. Um, like... I said, if there's anything I ask that you don't like, like you can just say, I don't want to answer that. By the way, I only give her and, you know, these kinds of podcasts, that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> when politicians are here, it's a different yeah. thing. Um, yeah, and, and you, at no point did you say, listen, like you're very open about, um, about what, what you're on. What does that give you? And what do you hope that gives uh, people listening? It's, not, it's never been about wanting anyone to feel sorry for my situation. It's n not that. What I want is for people to not wait for the shit to hit the fan, basically. To have right. a little glimmer of the way it changed me. Because I, I have been a very different person since all of this right. and it's nice <laughs> as horrible as it's been I feel so much better with myself with the world with my surroundings as ugly and as horrible as it can be I'm still feel at peace and I feel that that's such a beautiful thing and that's why I want to share if just take a bit of the story and when you're going through something hard try and find the peace within yourself to make peace with the difficulties that it's not the be all and end all of everything because it it does change it does get better you can move on yeah 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 yeah, yeah and uh i think uh, that's also exemplified by by what little man here is um shared before which was like oh, man i don't want to do this but we gotta do this let's go you know that that from you putting things into context in the way that that you have and the way the way that you've explained that you do where things are contextualized within this and i've seen how dark this stuff can get traffic's okay um, and accepting the truth, my God, my God, that is such a that is such a gift you have. That is such a gift you have. He amazes me like more. I know it's cliche, and we hear that a lot. You yeah. know, like oh wow, they change your life, and then nah, they do, man. Of they do. They do. I never, I never expected this. Never. Yeah. 
you know, even the, the things that he puts on me in a sense, you know, even just his questions, his dialogue, his, and I wish I was like a tiny, I don't know, bot in his brain just to, yeah. you know, even this last, again, this last admission where he was ready, getting ready for surgery and they're putting in the other cannula and he's sitting there and he's on my lap and he says to the doctor, tell me the risks, tell me what's going to happen, tell me what they're going to do and I want to know. And I'm there and it's like four o'clock in the morning and I'm four like, in the morning. <laughs> yes, and because they're prepping him and he was really unwell, but all of a sudden he got like this, this like, I, I don't even know how. And then she's explaining to but him. Uh, what uh, don't go, like don't drift on that point. It's an important point to make. I think what did he, what, what happened to him? So he was unwell. So he had just gone down for a CT. Mm -hmm. The results of this, the, the scan said that they came to the conclusion and decided, you know, we need to prep him for surgery for eight o'clock. Right. Um, and I'm, I told him all this, Henry, you're going to have to go surgery to, to surgery and get all this has to be sorted. And he said, okay. And he, from being unwell, it's like he... I can't explain it. I don't know. I would have been in like in a puddle. And he was there and he was just putting in the cannula and he's like, and he's, you know, all of a sudden he has like this, like surge of something, like superpower kind of. And he's sitting on my lap and tell me the, tell me what they're going to do. What do I need to do? Tell me um, what the risks are. She's explained to him. And I'm there going, okay, I'm, I'm glad I gave this child a voice, but. <laughs> and then he says, and can I die? And the doctor didn't answer him because you just can't answer that. And I started bawling my eyes out. And he turns to me and he says, it's okay, mommy. They're good here. You know how good, you know how much they take care of me here? It's like, they're really good here. Don't, don't cry. Don't worry, mommy. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And I'm like, okay, this kid has his shit together right now in this very moment. I have to pull my pants up and I have to get it together for him. Uh, I'm still waiting for my answer. I'm still waiting for my answer. They can't give you an answer. Does that mean I would have died? No, it means that it was one of the risks. There's always that risk, I guess, when you're doing surgery. That's what they tell you. Yeah. All right, listen. So let's get to... Um, so let's get to uh, the questions from our Patreons. Okay? Um, yeah, but before... Uh, you've had your uh, sip of the whiskey? Yeah. Okay, I was waiting for you. <laughs> Again, I never generally wait. But okay, cheers. Cheers. I started drinking. Oh my god, I am getting tummy full. <laughs> Let me stand up straight. Il patroni staso mi juba lil kom e biptala tal maple specificament mi sourdough tal maple li injubu awek anka bish netemau lil patroni ul team uli li ukol kul narta sipt filodu. Um, lul midjata kom ant wiet mil mil wiet tal maple fete sa si bu sour do ta kul toma din ne preferi tak ta talam adet ta zabuc mo anka sour do plain do kuma favoritie hobo af nash toma vera 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 taiba aktar menek il gi u vera ba shalula mat experience ash dak le spike tal insulin ali causa akt kon ayi nu le tar ju kuma de kapit kapit le Tiek kol kem tit hops. Un bat kompli bil ġonata tiek. Ma, han komplu, il patroni staqsu jien u l-arinda mamu. Alright, so, first question is from Eleanor. And she's asking, what are your coping mechanisms? Yeah, let's start there. What are your coping mechanisms? I look at the facts. What do I know? Because before I used to Google, that was like the biggest and worst thing, and I don't do that anymore. Um, I ask the questions. 
So before I like kind of jump to conclusions and like, you know, panic, I say, okay, what do I know? What are the facts? What do I not know? Who can I ask? Right. Who's going to tell me what? Right. I'll cope so long as they have answers. When I, when they were unclear or unsure, that's what was very much harder for me right. to deal with. But I cope by knowing the facts, knowing what's happening. Yeah. I, but you also mentioned to me last time you do um, creative stuff. Yes. So I, I love crafts. Is all that sorts like your of outlet? Crafts. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I love anything craft, sewing, any kind of anything I can do with my hands, anything. Um, so yeah, I, I notice like if I'm feeling particularly anxious or, you know, all over the place, I just say, okay, sit down and make something, anything, just do something with my hands. And I, I feel like I re, re, recompose. That's how you reset. Yes, I reset. Yeah. When I was a kid, I uh, somehow I, I I had stumbled upon, I, and I was uh, a very energetic child. couldn't couldn't focus on anything, uh, but I had stumbled upon uh, drawing uh, characters from Disney. And the calm, I used to sit there for yeah. like four hours just drawing these fucking characters. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Kid. <laughs> I'm a terrible role model. Yeah. Um, and I, now that I look back, I didn't realize what was going on, but I was, I was, I was somehow wading through all the crap in life and just landing on this thing that got me into a meditative state. And I wish they taught that more, a little more in schools. Cause that like, I had to discover meditation when I was like 26. So, uh, do you have any advice? This is also Eleanor. So, do you have any advice for parents who have just uh, received a, a diagnosis, presumably for their kids, right? Yes. Okay. That's a tough one. I, I get a lot of questions, even on social media, my Instagram. I get people sharing their story. Um, I always say, Ask the questions you need to ask. Don't feel, how do you say, um, intimidated by maybe everything that's new and bigger and feels so much. Yeah. You have to remember that your child needs you and you need to ask the questions for your child to be able to take care of the child. I think when you feel that that you are maybe in control isn't the right word, but when you have a handle on what you need to do, yeah. it helps you cope, it helps you move on, it helps you to take care because you feel like you have a part in the well-being of your child. So, you know, there are older children who get diagnosed with diabetes, for example, and it's quite traumatic for anyone, you know. And um, we had to deal with it, yes, from when he was born. But there have been, you know, you, have, you think you have a perfectly normal, healthy, healthy child. child yeah. And then out of the blue, something happens. And it can be very devastating and traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, t take handle of their treatment. Ask yeah. the questions you need yeah. to ask. Uh, education is power, I feel. Um, and where you don't know, try and learn. My formal background has, was in sciences while I was very, I'm very creative, but growing up, no, you can't have a job in art and design because you, you know, you have to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer. So fine. It was the seventies. It's okay. And my parents were very young. Generally though, the, the complaint is that they tell the women that, you know, no, you can't be a scientist. You're a woman. No, yeah. no. But that wasn't the case. No, it wasn't were. the case. It was, yes, drawing is cute, but mm -hmm. it's not going to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, so my formal education has been in sciences. So I have an understanding of like, you know, bio, and I feel thankful for that education because it's helped me. But if you don't know something, yeah. the internet is huge. Obviously, you can go to reliable sources yeah. and the medical 
teams are very helpful. If you ask, they will help you. I know that. Were you aware that you're as tough as you are? No. I thought I was one big wuss. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I still don't think I am, but... Oh, shut up. When I told Henry, you're so brave, he says, we're same brave. So we're I'm, same brave. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think people are far tougher than they yes. realize. And it's only when you're put to the test, like you have, that you realize just how incredibly tough and resilient you can be. Years ago when he, when I got diagnosed and he was unwell and I, I never forget this. My mom said to me, he goes, she said, Matafush kif salvai tu tshushin, kif edin es salvau el tshushin, o et es salvali lek o ento te salvali. And that just rings in my head all the time. She saw, I mean, she, she could see that we're just, I was moving through the motions for him without him knowing he was saving me. Mushik, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely that kind of experience that breaks you out of your shell into like a, a maturity and never conceived about yourself. I'm so grateful for it though, because people spend a lifetime not feeling like this. Yeah. A sure. lifetime or, or they never feel like this. And though it was hard, it's really, I've never felt more myself, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. All right. I'll say this story. Then if, <laughs> then if we decide like we're just going to remove it, then we'll just remove it. But um, so recently I'm reading up on a, uh, an unhealthy amount of Jung. So I wake up and I read Jung. I go to bed um, reading Jung. I have one chat where I'm just persuading people to start reading Jung and then I invite them to the chat. Um, so anyway, yesterday I was reading the Bible, not because I'm religious, but, but I was... Uh, Still good. Um, I think there's a lot of... Uh, it's messages. imbued with a yes. lot of meaning that yes. the, the story, if you take it in a literary sense, it means stupid almost. But then when you read into it, so the, the, the story was the story of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. So the prodigal son, at, at, like if you take it in uh, at face value, it makes zero sense. It's almost like pissing you off because you have this, this father who's maybe opulent or whatever says, Hey sons, he has two sons, uh, go out into the, like who wants to take their inheritance and, you know, do, do whatever you want with it. And once I, well, the, well, like the, the, the responsible son, I'm pointing myself responsible, no, the responsible <laughs> son uh, says, Oh no, uh, not me that I'll, you know, I'll stick around with you and we'll uh, raise cattle and I'll uh, milk the cows, whatever says none of this in the Bible. He just says, uh, yes, I'll stay here. Uh, and then the other one says, I no, I'll take the inheritance. Off I go into the world and do all sorts of heinous debauchery. And I, I'm just going to go and experience the darkest uh, annals of my personality, my psyche and the world. And then obviously this runs him into a lot of trouble as it always does. He realizes, shit, I need daddy's help. Um, cause he can't eat. He's broke. All his friends betrayed him. So he goes back to his dad and the dad meets him at the gate and says, Oh, amazing. You're back. Uh, let's kill the fattened calf and have a big feast for the son. And obviously the son has been around the whole time. It's like, what are you doing? What the hell are you talking about? Like I've been here the whole time. He's, he's been off squandering the inheritance money that you've earned throughout the entirety of your painstaking life. And now we're throwing him apart. It's like, yes, yes, because, because he was lost. That's where we get the line. He was lost it's and now he's found, found, right? From a Jungian perspective, what that means is that the father is the psyche. It's like the entire psyche. <coughs> the, 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 the responsible son, is what I guess Freud would call the, the super ego. Mm. It's like, uh, I should be responsible. I should, you know, keep things under control. I should do what's demanded of me. 
But then there's another part of us, which is the dark, which is the dark part of us, which is the, 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 the dark part of humanity. And until as a human being, as a single human being, you integrate all of those parts, you are incomplete. So what the psyche is represented by the father is celebrating is the integration of the shadow into the psyche. And now I am whole. Mm. But what that means is you can't, you, you almost, you cannot be a full person without having visited the dark side. So yeah, I didn't get cracking. <laughs> uh, no, don't get cracking. Keep it all under control. All right, so listen, Kylie uh, has a question for Henry. Could you come back over here? Guess who's back? Again. Back again. <laughs> Henry's back. Tell a friend. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Ba -da 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 -da. So I used to rap Henry when I was younger. Uh, really? When I still had a hairline. <laughs> really? You like rap at all? Mm, I listen to it, but I don't know how to rap really well. You don't know? I could teach you. No. I not interested? Not okay, my type. That's my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so listen, Henry. Yes. Uh, um, Kylie over there. Mm -hmm. She's asking, if you had to pass on a message to all the children in the world, mm -hmm. low bar, very low bar, what would you say? <laughs> we can start with like, John's amazing. <laughs> It's always a good, like, go to that whenever it's out. Don't forget that no matter what you go through, you're always going to be the one leading this journey or adventure. Oh. <laughs> I know. You have no idea how wise that is, bro. <laughs> There is a guy called Jiddu Krishnamurti. I don't know. I don't know if you know this guy. No. So Jiddu Krishnamurti. Let me tell you a quick story, and, and then we can wrap this up, and then we can go. Um, I can go clobber you at basketball. <laughs> no, I think. I think it's the other way around. But yeah, 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 we won't yeah. tell our. My audience thinks I'm cool. Shh. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> so listen. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this guy called Jiddu Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. and Jiddu Krishnamurti was. Uh, I'll give you the. Short, long version. Okay. So he was playing on a beach when he was a kid, a kid, about your age, right? Yeah. And there was like this boat of very rich people coming into, I believe it was Goa. Goa, Goa. is like this place in South India. Okay. And for some reason, they, they decided that this kid is the Messiah. Okay. You, the, you know what the Messiah is? Like the God? Yeah, like the guy that's going to save humanity, right? Okay. For some reason, they decided that. But anyway, so they take him back to, to the to the United States and in the United States they give him an education I think they sent him to Oxford as well which is on the other side of the pond and they treat him like he's royalty and all the, the while he's feeling like all this pressure because they, they just like yanked this guy out of his na native home in India and now they're telling him you're going to save the world oh you are the guiding light of humanity it's like okay maybe I don't know but he was very smart he was like he was very smart and after they spent years and years and years preparing for, like preparing him and putting him through all of this education and training and theology and spirituality and meditation and, and, and doing all sorts of mantras with this guy, it, there comes the time for him to finally deliver his first speech. This is after years of the preparation. And his speech was basically, you have to be a light to yourself. Mm. Every person is responsible for their own life. So don't put that responsibility on me. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> and I'm back off to India. <laughs> Eventually, he still became like a world-renowned guru. And um, I read a, a, a few of his... Uh, did I ever read his books? No, I heard him talk a bunch of times. I don't think I ever read any of his books. But anyway... <laughs> It took him many years to get to where you got. So, really? yeah, 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 yeah. So your message is 
You're the one in control. <laughs> All right. Can I can I ask you one last question? Yes. If someone uh, is a kid like yes. you, and they're going through a hard time, mm-hmm. do you have a message for them? Stay strong. Stay strong. All right. And don't be afraid to ask anything to the doctors. Yeah. Are, w- when the doctors uh, are around and you ask them questions, are they helpful? Yeah, you can be honest here. Yeah, you, can, yeah, you, can you don't I need to... Him. This I is, him. Yes, but no. Yes, but no. Okay, tell me more about that. I'm interested. So, like... They give me the... F- they give me, like, a part of it. Mm-hmm. But then the rest, they don't tell me. Which part did they not give you? I don't know. I don't know what part. But you just feel like you don't get the whole script? Mm-hmm. They leave parts out? Yeah, I so just, just feel like they leave parts out. You just want them to be more truthful, huh? Mm-hmm. Because you can deal with the truth. Yeah. You're strong. You're very, 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 very admirable. Very admirable. Okay. So, Adele has a question. That's for who? Stick around. Stick around. Yeah? Okay. Four? For him. Oh, okay. Okay. The first one? Both. Okay. So, Adele is asking... Okay. Have you learned to listen more to your own intuition? What's an intuition? Okay, I'll, I'll explain intuition now. Okay, this is, this is harder than I thought. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> as that, so like, do you know what a gut feeling is? When you think something, when you like oh. have this Inside, knowledge have out of feeling of, of something, yeah, out ah, of nowhere, uh-huh, and then you know uh-huh. it's like the right thing to do. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I get. Hmm. Do you have that? Do you have that? Do you ever get that feeling? I, yes, I do get it. You do get that feeling? When? When do you get that feeling? I don't know when. Like, it could happen to me now. And I wouldn't be feeling anything. Did you get a gut feeling when you walked into this uh, studio today? No, but I was in shock of how cool it was. Good answer. Good answer. Are you enjoying your time here with us? Yes. Yeah, we're enjoying our time our time here with you. So Adele has a another important question. Ask away. What's the score gonna be like when you beat John at basketball? I feel like that question is loaded, <laughs> and I also feel like it's making some foregone conclusions. One hundred zero. <laughs> it hurts. I feel like you listen to your intuition there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I'm going to have to learn how to deal with the truth. So on that semi-positive note, uh, you guys have a final message for our audience. I'll start with I start with you, Henry, and then I'll end with your mom. Hmm. Do you, what do you call her? Mom? Mommy? Ma? Yo? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes... When I don't feel like saying mom, usually I just say, Ma, Ma I nice. want a snack. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you say please at the end of that. Please. Mm-hmm. If you're reminded, <laughs> you kids are out this time. Uh, yeah. What is my, my daughter calls me, no, my daughter calls me daddy. Yeah, daddy or pa. The old one just calls me ugly. <laughs> I feel that's unfair. I feel that's unfair. <laughs> uncalled for. Uncalled for. I have feelings. But does your younger daughter love you? I believe so. I'm mm. sure she does. But 
I don't think she loves me as much as I love her. I don't think that's possible. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's the truth. Mm. But I'm so happy to. It's such a blessing to be able to have the privilege to love your child. Yes, I agree. Yeah, you're the one being loved. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky butt. Cheeky butt. <laughs> All right. So, uh, did he give us a, a, a closing statement or did you just say he's going to trash me a basketball? Bizzies minus shin sana esperienza i esses jo fruaz la kbira ta' dual plak ex u txiet u aċessori elektriċi ta' kualita. Zoru om ġo għaxorum ta' hon flimriħel jon kella fu iss.com.nt Maura sal għannu ta' derek mux transazzjoni kif ġibu laħa fejna parti tin għeda bliffi għan kualita se tiġi mejjun sabi xie sawar laħar fin tijak dwar dak li jattikol u tit mal il-familtek. Biss jak mandek xil hint ta' disa fejnu mil-belt ibat WhatsApp li derek fuq 9986-6425 bix wastu lek il-xirja fuq l-adba. Do you identify with that bird with the french fry? I've actually been... So I get you, uh, yes. we have to move the mic close, closer. Oh. I have been contemplating changing and just changing it to my name. Um, just Lorinda Ma more, right? Yes. How was that pronounced in Canada? Was it like No, but I'm... Mamo? But... Ah, I shouldn't be sweet. Yes, I uh, was... Ne? Telma. 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 Fiuma in Canada. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Fiuma. <laughs> uh-huh. Cringe. Mo- most things he can't accept. <laughs> It's a, tra- is... it's a try not to cringe challenge now. <laughs> <laughs> Fuma. Fuma. Right, so so you were uh, making the consideration of Yeah, but it just it's just so much of a so much a part of me that I'm just yeah. like mm, I don't need to change it. I love it, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> like when Kylie explained to me what it meant. <laughs> I love these things that are imbued with layers yeah. of meaning. And it's a great story. Yeah. It's such a great story yeah. because it, it, it uh, it's something that caught your eye when you were younger and you liked it. You didn't really register what it no. means completely. And then later in life, it's like, that's what that meant. And no one will ever, after watching this, look at a bird with a french fry ever the same again. For sure. I know I won't. Unless it's my french fry. <laughs> in which case, I want that shit back. <laughs> So, do you have a a closing message for the people listening to us? Very hard. I don't know. I suppose if you're going through something, you might feel that it's like the end of everything or you can't get through it. Like I have so many times and you just do. I don't know how you find the strength somehow and you get through it. There are people around who love you, you might not feel it, but you reach out to find that love um, or accept that love because it might not be maybe the way you interpret it or yeah. maybe the way you're expecting it. But love is also, can I bring you something to eat? Um, take that and it, it just, it warms you and it softens, you know, that going through something hard can harden you. And hmm. positivity, I, I talk about positivity and trying to be positive all the time because it's harder to get out of the anger because the anger is like exponential in a hmm. way. So it just, hmm. you know, you feel angry and it just like drops you. Yeah. But we have to actively work at being positive and happy because it's like, I feel like it's going, like you're going to the gym. Mm. You train your muscles and you build. I feel like over the years I've trained my mind. Doesn't mean I don't get sad. Uh, It's not in a toxic way. Um, But I feel like I have... um, I have like an armor and I can say, okay, I can pick up that armor and say, okay, it's time to make peace with what's happening. And yes, it's crap and it's shit. And I know what's happening, but I'm not gonna let it pull me down. Mm-hmm. Um, the analogy that I liked 
to use with Henry to explain that is that like our mind is like a garden and we like a garden in, in nature can get full of weeds and like those weeds are like our bad thoughts. It's normal. It happens. Yeah. It's part of the process of life and growing mm -hmm. and it's incredible. Yeah. But we have to let it grow like like a natural process, but then we have to effort we have to put effort into pulling that weed out because if we don't then there's no space for the flowers. Yeah. Yeah. And the acceptance of the weeds. It's because incredible. we're human. Exactly. It's they're going to sprout. Yeah. So don't I mean like we know in normal, you know, the weeds if you let them they'll take over. Yeah. Like the bad thoughts like I've had very, you know, and if you let it take over, they take over really quickly, quicker than flowers. So the flowers For you have sure. to nurture, you have to, you know, help them. And for me, it's like those, that's, those are the good thoughts, you know, we have, but we have to nurture them. All right. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you <laughs> for having us come here. It was a true honor. Thank you. Thank you. You're a natural. All right. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash John Malia. If you'd like to support uh, this podcast and continuing to uh, deliver this kind of content, tell these kind of stories, have these kind of difficult, um, heartwarming, beautiful conversations that are difficult, but just so bursting with love. Um, and it's encouraged me and I'm sure it's given a lot of his heart and a lot of people that, that people have listened. Um, so thank you for that. Thank guys. you. Thanks for having Solid us. Solid stuff. Thank Solid you. stuff. Thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, the, the sponsors of the show and that's uh, Hungry Hippie, Vina Capricita Abram, uh, Browns. I'd like to thank uh, Maypole uh, for providing the, the sourdough, Apex Media, GSE, Technologies, ESS Electra, uh, eCabs for bringing me over, bringing our peoples over here. Uh, I'd like to thank Kutrigo, uh, also Garmin, and Derek Meads, 996645. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience, I'm assuming, because I see none of you. <laughs> Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>